Great. Good morning, everybody. And it is an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be in this beautiful surroundings here in Sonica with such a great group of people. Um, my name is Emer O'Gorman. I'm a director of services with Fingal County Council. Um, I was just ex explaining to a couple of colleagues that I've recently changed role. So I'm kind of straddling two, um, two roles at the moment. I was the Director for Economic Enterprise and Tourism Development in Fingal County Council, so the Fingal Skills Strategy and all of the work um, that's going to be showcased today um, has been driven through my department over the last three years. But I've moved, I suppose, I suppose, into a new role in People, Corporate and Digital Services, which is really about the internal functioning of the local authority, and again, all about skills and how we, as a local authority, can bring the best and the brightest to work for Fingal and with Fingal. So this piece of work is hugely, hugely important. I'm very, very proud of it, and I'm just I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Um, we're going to have a lot of, I suppose, interesting conversations and hopefully really fruitful discussions and connections made as a result of this morning. And if, if you go come away from this morning having met a person and spoken to a person that can help you in your line of work or in your field, our job is done for today. So just before we get started, the usual housekeeping uh, announcements. If you can, put your phones onto um, silence, please. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, there are emergency exits and the staff will direct you towards them. You can see them on the left, they're very well signposted. There is Wi-Fi available here um, in the room and um, it's Sonica HQ Guest. And if you want to write down the password, I'll give it to you here now, if anybody's interested. It's P455W, lowercase, O, uppercase, O or D, exclamation point. If anybody needs that, you can just check in, I suppose, during the day. There are no requirements legally, I suppose, to wear a face mask, but if you feel more comfortable doing so, please do. Um, there is hand sanitizer and other um, public health measures around the building, and just please avail of those if needs be. Um, today's event is being recorded. Um, we would encourage you to use your social media accounts uh, where appropriate. Um, our hashtag for today is hashtag Fingal Skills Strategy. And now to officially um, open today's event, I'm delighted to introduce our Mayor um, of Fingal, Councillor Shona O'Rudig. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emer. Good morning, everyone. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all to the beautiful seaside town of Skerries um, and to the magnificent Sonica building, the first landings building. In particular, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Minister for Further and Higher Education, Minister Simon Harris, um, and I know he's travelled from, from another lovely seaside town for being with us today and for demonstrating his commitment and his support for this morning's event that will include ideas, collaboration and action as part of Fingal Skills Strategy. I want to warmly welcome all our elected representatives, I see TDs and, and my fellow councillors also, the panellists who are going to take part today, our guest speakers and all of you. As Mayor of Fingal, over the past year, I have witnessed the incredible work that is ongoing in the Economic, Enterprise, Tourism and Cultural Development Department over the past year. And this has been led by Emer and her team. And I really want to thank Emer for everything she has done over the past few years, in particular in, in relation to this initiative, but everything that she's done. And I want to wish her the best in her new role within the Council. We all know that the nature of work is changing. In Fingal, we're playing catch up in many regards as the youngest, fastest growing, um, most diverse county in the state. But which, with that also comes many, many advantages of having such a young, vibrant population. We understand that business success and economic development relies on having access to the right talent, the relevant skills, and a focus on meeting future skills needs. This strategy sets out a host of specific actions that include developing and delivering training, creating opportunities for collaboration with employers, with educational institutions and other stakeholders. This morning is going to feature lots of networking to forge new connections between all the different stakeholders and the ability for the education sector to respond to the needs of an industry in a quick manner, ma manner is really imperative. Fingal County Council was ahead of the curve in this initiative and in identifying future skills gaps because we realise how important it is. And I'm really looking forward to listening and hearing more about the steps in this strategy later on. 
Recently, myself and Emer, um, we attended the Fingal Student Enterprise Awards um, in County Hall, which was really, it was fantastic. And as someone who studied enterprise in GCU many years ago, um, this is always a huge area of interest for me. But one of the things that struck me most about all of the presentations that the students did was how they engaged with their customers in receiving feedback. So how much things have changed since I would have been do doing similar things, what social media has done, that that um, real-time feedback, that they were able to engage and then they were able to respond to what people were telling them. And in some ways, this forum has created something similar. So what you need is that you know where to go if you need to express what's needed in terms of training or if you know about apprentices or if you're an employer. And it's that space that is so vitally important. And you, you can't really quantify how important it is until you create it. I know I chaired the Ukrainian Community Response Forum and that's a similar thing. All the stakeholders coming together, some weeks you might have something to say, some weeks you mightn't, but you know the people to go to and that really is invaluable. So making these connections can only serve to lower obstacles in, commun in communication and it will enable all of us really to act quickly for the benefit of us all. Finally, I wish everyone a really productive, fun and informative morning. Thank you so much for joining us in Scaries. I didn't have too far to travel. I, this is my hometown. Gaurav Mila Magwiv and I will hand you over to Minister, I think is it? Yes, I will hand you over to Minister Simon Harris. Thank you so much. Gaurav Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and thank you very much to everybody uh, for the warm welcome here to the uh, incredible Sonica building. This is a really uh, a really funky place to be holding an event, and I know a really great uh, asset here, here here in the community. And I'm delighted to be here today. I'm delighted to be here and joined by my colleagues, Deputy Alan Farrell, Senator Regina Doherty, Councillor Tom O'Leary, and indeed other public representatives, whom I haven't had a chance to, to speak with you yet. Thank you very much um, for inviting me. It's good to see the, the President of DCU here uh, as well today as a sign of his uh, commitment. I said to you at the last event, I'm getting fed up praise in DCU everywhere I go <laughs> for your, your doing your <laughs> leading the way on collaboration and innovation. I have to keep on tweeting and thanking in person DCU for yet again leading the way. But it's, I, I, I'm really grateful that you're here, Dara, uh, as a sign of the commitment uh, of DCU. And thank you very much to Fingal uh, County Council for leading the way yet again um, in terms of this initiative to your acting chief executive, to Emer and her team. I know a lot of work goes into arranging events like today. So thank you to everybody um, who has been involved um, in organising today's event. Today is really about partnership in action. Uh, it's about bringing together industry uh, academia and relevant agencies, pulling them all together, coming together to deliver the Fingal skills strategy and crucially to develop solutions. It's very easy in public life to identify the problems, very easy. You have to take it to the next level though, analyse where the challenges are and then what are we all going to do about them together and in looking through the skills strategy I think that's really clear. It is an action orientated plan. Who's going to do what to identify the challenges that we face here in this county to make sure uh, that we are ready uh, for the future. So I want to thank you uh, for the leadership role you have played in that. You are the first county in the country to have done this. Um, there is a question now as to why everybody's not doing this and I'll certainly be taking that uh, away from, from today because I expect many, many more uh, will follow in your footsteps. Uh, this strategy will act uh, as a roadmap uh, for future skills development and indeed as a model of best practice for local authorities uh, right across the country. I think it's fair to say local authorities have been getting more embedded in the space uh, of enterprise and skills uh, in recent years. That's a very welcome development, but we do need to take it to the next level now. The local authority has a unique role to play uh, in a county in pulling together all of the relevant stakeholders. And that leadership role um, being utilised today is very, very welcome. This country has a long-standing partnership uh, when it comes to enterprise and education, and it's served us very well. And I must say, it's actually talked about beyond these shores. When I attend uh, European meetings with counterparts with the European Commission, people ask about our model in relation to the regional skills fora. This has been a really successful model where we bring together employers, we bring together enterprise and the local education providers, and we map out what is needed in our country. And I must say, even in a country as geographically small as Ireland, it never fails to amaze me how actually the skills needs are different um, as you move from region to region. And that's, that, that's the benefit 
uh, of the regional skills fora, you can actually sit down and look at your own region and say, well, what do we want to be really good at in this region? What do we want to lead at in this region? And what are the skills that we need our education system to help us provide uh, if we are to lead in that area? The Dublin uh, Regional Skills Forum, in particular through the forum manager, Natasha Kinsler, who I'm delighted to see in person, having looked at on Zoom for, for, for so long. Um, you're working really, really hard to ensure that we have the availability of skills and talent and helping to realise the region's enterprise and economic potential and to address our upskilling and reskilling requirement. I want to thank you uh, for all that you're doing and I know you've been a key stakeholder uh, the forum in the development of this strategy uh, for Fingo. So thank you also for that. When we talk about skills, we've got to see this as an investment. This isn't a nice to do thing. This isn't something that we should do if we get around to it. This is actually really, really important. Um, it is not accidental that in some of the areas where we face the biggest, biggest societal challenges, matched with that challenge is also a skills shortage. So where I work and Alan works and Regina works, to give one example, every day people stand up in Dáil Éireann and Shannon Éireann and say, we must build more houses. And sure, of course we must. But there's no one in the Dáil or the Shannon going to build any. We, ha this, we have created a country where our education system has narrowed the discussion too much and it has resulted in acute skills shortages. Climate action is the same. Climate action, biggest crisis facing our generation, facing our globe. Talking about it's not going to fix it. If we want to fix it, we need to retrofit half a million homes by 2030. Who's going to do that? We have report upon report telling us that we need about 17,000 more people working uh, in retrofitting. So how do we come together to make sure we have the infrastructure in place to provide that training, but also to make sure we begin to whet the public appetite uh, in terms of opting for these careers and opting to help us meet uh, those skills shortages as well. I'm very proud of our education system in this country. I think we have every reason to be. Uh, about 50 years ago, we had 20,000 people in full-time higher education. We now have 250,000. I mean, it's an incredible story to tell the progress that this nation has made in 50 years when it comes to higher education. But we also have to be honest about the things that we're not that good at as well, because you can never be complacent. And we're not that good at lifelong learning. We're not. We still culturally see education as something you do, you know, till you're 18, you go to school and then maybe you go on to college and then you're done. We know, you know, business leaders know that's not the way anymore. More and more, no matter how well qualified you are or if you haven't had an opportunity to be qualified, we know that people are going to need to dip in and out of our education system um, to meet the changes in terms of how we work and how we live. But how do you do that in a way that works? How do we recognise that not every student is 18 and wants to go off to university for four years and pack the bags? You know, more and more, the student is going to be 45 with a full-time job, two kids and a mortgage. And how do we make sure that they can access the education system in a way that works for them? And I think we saw the beginnings of some of the answers during the COVID pandemic. You wouldn't obviously wish a COVID pandemic on anybody, but we did see how our education system can be flexible, uh, can be adaptive. I met people, particularly women learners. I met people who told me that they wouldn't have been able to access education had it not moved online but actually moving it online provided them with an opportunity. So how do we take the learnings of what has been a really difficult couple of years, but a couple of years where we saw a really responsive, adaptive, uh, flexible education system. So I'm determined that we put in place policy levers to get lifelong learning uh, to where it needs to be. And that's going to involve a number of things. It's going to involve supporting our higher education institutions, funding them properly and making sure um, that they're supported in the delivery of flexible education. It's also going to mean having to have a conversation uh, with the business community about what do they need to do to be freed up and empowered to enable their employee uh, take the time to be upskilled uh, and reskilled. And what does the citizen need? You know, in many ways, we're time poor these days. Uh, people are busy. It's easy to put something off. How do we make it as easy as possible for the citizen and maybe as attractive as possible? How do we incentivise it um, as well? So this is a key policy plank we're working on uh, in the relatively new uh, department that I head. And we're not working on it alone. Um, I've commissioned the OECD to comprehensively review uh, Ireland's skills strategy with a particular focus on the issue of lifelong learning. What I don't want to do is just pick up some model from another country and say, we're going to try that here. It doesn't work. We need an Irish model. We need a model that works for our country, a model that works for our education system, a model that will culturally work here. But we can learn from best international practice. So I expect very shortly, uh, this year, to begin to receive the output from that, what the OECD thinks from a policy point of view we can do in terms of supporting lifelong learning and changing the culture uh, in that regard as well. So that's, that's one area I just want to flag that I hope our policy work will help you. The second area, though, is back to traditional school leavers is back to the 17 or 18 year old young man or young woman sitting in a classroom uh, today. And, and we need to change um, how we're interacting with them. It's actually horrific, the amount of pressure 
we're putting on 17 and 18 year olds. Like I'm going to going to schools in Louth after I leave you here. And I can tell you before I even go in the door, because I've been to 60 something secondary schools this year so far, talking to six year students, you see the fear in their eyes. I mean, you can just see the complete and utter stress. No, life's not easy. We get that. The Leaving Cert will always be, has always been a stressful moment in time. But it's not right that we've now defined people's pathways or convinced people, at least, that their pathways are defined based on how they do in some rote exams. It's not right. It's not fair. You could have two, two students sitting side by side, both want to be nurses. One does better at the rote exam, the other person be a better nurse. We have to actually change this conversation. And we also have to decide how we're going to make sure we don't hide all of the other options how we don't actually say, it's all about the CAO, it's all about the CAO. I mean, the CAO has become a conversation up there with the weather. You know, what are you putting on your CAO? We're telling our students nearly to pick the name of the university, and of course it would be DCU, wouldn't it? Uh, but to pick, the name of, <laughs> to pick the name of the university before they actually pick the course, the thing that they want to do. So we've got to, we've got to reverse the conversation. What am I passionate about? What difference do I want to make in the world? What makes it easier to get out of bed on a rainy Monday morning? And then we, the education system, have to show them how to get there. And there are, with a few exceptions, almost always more than one way. And this is where I think further education and training really comes into its own and pathways between further education and higher education. So you meet the student who worked hard and wanted to be a lawyer and since they were this height and they missed out on the points and they think that's it, my dreams are dashed, I can't be it or I have to go back and repeat the leaving search. It's actually not true. You can go and do a PLC course in Cavan Institute, real life example, do a year in law, and then you can go from there to complete your law degree in Maynooth. But we decided not to tell anybody this. So for the first year this year, we've changed the CAO website. So when our young people log on to cao.ie forward slash options, they see effectively three buttons. One button that gives them the traditional CAO, another that gives them further education and training, and crucially, and I'm delighted Dr. Mary Liz Trant, the head of our apprenticeship office is here, crucially another that tells them all about their apprenticeship options as well. So a minister changing a website, is that a big deal? Well, it's not the end of the matter, but it is a starting point to change the conversation. When the young man or woman sits down with the mum or the dad on the couch or the kitchen table and talking about the CAO, that conversation is now involving further education and training uh, and apprenticeships. So um, I want to do an awful lot more in, in relation to that. And I really would ask your help here in Fingal in terms of joining up the conversation. It's about all of the education partners working together. It's about all of the pathways. Uh, and that brings me to the issue of apprenticeships. There's a lot of low hanging fruit here, quite frankly. Um, we're doing well. We're doing better than we've been doing probably ever before. Um, we saw last year the highest number of apprenticeship registrations ever. Um, I think 8,607 from my memory, is that right? Yeah, 8,607. Um, but we're ambitious to do more. And again, quite frankly, we need to do more. We've set ourselves a target of having 10,000 new registered apprentices in this country every year by 2025. And to get there, we know we need to make life a lot easier for the business community and for the apprentice. So that's why we've established our new National Apprenticeship Office. You're going to hear from its first director, Mary Liz Trant, uh, later today. So she'll go into the detail in relation to that. But to coordinate the apprenticeship programme, to reform it, to help progress curriculum review, um, to give a voice to apprentices, to bring the business community together. Really exciting agenda there. We've taken a number of initiatives to make it easier for a business to take on an apprentice, including cash. So providing financial grants of around two grand a year to, an apprentice, to a business who takes on an apprentice, two grand a year per apprentice. You know, to try and make it easier, not just for the big companies to get involved, but also for the smaller guy with the, the traditional man or woman with the van who might like to take on an apprentice, but does need to be actually supported in that regard. We've brought in very recently a bursary uh, for gender equality. We're, we're, uh, to say we're not where we need to be in this area would be a underst uh, massive understatement. Um, I mean, we, ha we have to encourage more women into our apprenticeship programs and providing a financial bursary to do that. Uh, and, and if you don't mind me saying so, at a gathering of a local authority uh, event, we in the public sector need to step up. Um, I think it's really bad, I, I sometimes use the word pathetic, that there's over 300,000 people working in the public service and between us all we take on less than 200 apprentices a year. I mean, it's paltry. So we've set ourselves a target by 2025 of taking on 750 apprentices in the public sector each year. Culturally, that will help again because the mums and the dads of Ireland will see my son or daughter can get that good job in that public sector. That helps. And practically, it will help as well. It will help local authorities, government departments deliver public services too. So between now and the summer, we intend to map out 
what can the public sector do in terms of apprenticeships and not keep it kind of vague and woolly. What here in Fingal can you do? How many apprentices a year can Fingal take on? And indeed, in what areas um, do you have a requirement and a need? And we'll be working with, with you all very closely in, in relation to that. But I do passionately believe that if we can get the apprenticeship system right in this country, um, it will be transformational in terms of the delivery of the skills needs of our country and additional pathways for people to get to the careers that they want uh, to get to as well. And I know Mary Liz will expand uh, on, that, on that later um, as well. So I'm standing here today as a Minister for Further and Higher Education saying we've made a lot of progress as a country. Um, we have amongst the highest progression rates from second level to third level in the European Union. But we also are living in a rapidly changing world and we need to accelerate our pace of change. The only way we can do that is through collaboration. That's why I wanted to be here today because I think it's such an exciting model. Not academics telling business what to do or business telling academics, but actually getting all of us in the room and saying, you know, we all live in the same community. We all live in the same country. We're proud of our community. We're proud of our country. We want it to work. What can we do together to meet those skills needs? And I'll end where I started by saying what you're doing here in Fingal uh, is the model absolutely the model uh, which I wanted to endorse today that should be rolled out right across our country working with our skills fora uh, and I'll certainly be taking that message back to government where uh, where Fingal has led others must now follow I want to wish you the very best for the day and thank you very much for having me here Thank you very, very much, Minister Harris, and um, really interesting just your observations, and it is about partnership in action. I think that's a real key takeaway for us today. Um, the local authority sector are really good at pulling stakeholders into a room, but it has to be on an equal footing with all the partners around the table, and I think we do that really, really well in Fingal, um, and it's something that can be replicated in other areas, but it is that partnership in, a in action, listening actively listening to what each other needs and wants and how we can work together to help achieve those goals. Um, really delighted that you could make it here today and thank you very much um, for your very kind words. Um, the skills strategy came about um, through our strategic policy committee. So the strategic policy committees, for those that aren't familiar, are the policy engine houses of our local authority system and are, ch are made up of a group of stakeholders. Um, some of them are elected members and others are um, chambers of commerce, for example, on the economic committee, the local enterprise office, for example, coming together generating ideas and then transforming them into policies. So that is the genesis of the Fingo Skills Strategy. That's where it came from. Um, the chair of the committee, um, Councillor Tony Murphy, um, can't be with us today, unfortunately, but he has recorded a short message, which you're going to see on screen now, just to kind of maybe talk through how we got from there to where we are today. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Minister Harris, fellow councillors and invited guests. Sorry I can't be there in person with you today. I have a statutory meeting this morning I have to attend. As chairperson of the Economic Enterprise and Tourism Development Strategic Policy Committee, which developed the thoughts that created the understandings of the need for a Fingal Skills Strategy, I'd just like to give you some of the background to this. At a national level, there was and still is a conversation regarding the capacity within the building sector to deliver the quantity of houses needed to address the current housing crisis. So the question being asked is, are there enough apprentices taking up trades to support this sector? This prompted a question with regard to the challenges that different employment sectors across Fingal were having in getting the required skilled labour force. We need to understand at a local level where the gaps were and what interaction there was between the educators and, and the employers. So this brought about the setting up of Fingal Skills Strategy Advisory Group, which was chaired by Siobhan Kinsler of No Recruitment, and key stakeholders from local industry and education providers in Fingal were also invited to join. It's also evidence that large employers and FDIs seek to locate in areas where appropriate educated workforce is readily available. So the strategy's purpose is to ensure that Fingal is well positioned to capitalise on future vacancies, having the right people skilled in the right disciplines to fill jobs for the future. The strategy creates an opportunity for Fingal, having the youngest and most diverse population in Ireland, to align supply and demand of skills over the next five years. Now, as we move into what we might call a post-COVID position, we are seeing deficits in recruitment in the hospitality sector, for example, and that needs to be addressed. So the implementation of this strategy is building connections between education and industry stakeholders, and it couldn't be more timely. Fingal County Council is the first local authority to develop a skills strategy to consider existing and future skills gaps. 
I would ask attendees at this event to get involved with the skills strategy. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank a few people who have been instrumental in making this happen from a Fingal County Council's perspective. Ed Hearn, former Director of Economic Enterprise and Tourism Development. Siobhan Kinsler of Noel Recruitment, who has invested a serious amount of time in this strategy from its inception. And Diemer O'Gorman, the most recent Director of Economic Enterprise and Tourism Development, who has taken the strategy to the most important stage, that of its implementation. Thank you very much. So as Tony said, it started off in the SPC, um, and, but bringing the skills strategy to life um, was always going to need a strong team with serious expertise in the area. So the skills strategy implementation group is made up of experts from industry, education and training sectors, ourselves and local government and state agencies. The group is very ably chaired by Siobhan Kinsler, Managing Director of the Noel Group and former president of both Fingal Chamber and Chambers Ireland. Siobhan is very passionate about skills development and the importance of collaboration between industry, education and the agencies. I'm delighted to welcome Siobhan to the stage and we're going to discuss how the strategy has evolved and how it's going to continue to evolve. Good morning. morning. Good morning, Siobhan. You're very, very welcome. Thank you very <laughs> much. Delighted to have you here. It's, you know, we're old friends at this stage. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose, I mean, by way of background, I mean, Siobhan was on the SPC that came up with the idea of the skills strategy and has taken it really from the genesis to its implementation. As Minister Harris said earlier on, we're great at writing policies and we're great at talking about things, but actually doing and getting down to do the work is where the real action is. And I mean, my sincere thanks to Siobhan for leading that implementation group. And we're really seeing the output of her labours and the group's labours now. A couple of questions for you, Siobhan. <laughs> Starter for 10, as they'd say. The strategy was published in 2019. So tell us about the stakeholders and your involvement in, in drafting up the strategy. So if you, if you go back to the, the 2019 reality, we'd had an awful lot of change in Ireland. We'd had the 2014 Local Government Development Bill, which brought business into the definition of community and economic development into the world of the local authority. We had the development of the 13 education and training boards. We had higher education funding models that were created by Andrew Brownlee, current chief executive of Solus. And then we had moves into the curricula in the education and training boards and the further education sector being more focused on engaging with industry and what future skills needs would be. We also had the development of the regional skills fora, which I chaired for a period with uh, our able, ably uh, appointed manager, Natasha Kinsla. Um, but in all of that evolution, what we didn't have is the link for the educators, uh, the state agencies and the employers to actually come together. And if you're running a business in, in Ireland, if you're, if you're leading foreign direct investment multinational, it's quite likely you'll talk directly to Dara and he will take your call. Um, but if you are a smaller business, who do you talk to? How do you find the provision? How do you find the, the people that you're looking for? There's so much out there and there's no way to navigate it. So the Solace Labour Market Research Unit do some fantastic work. And I used to work in further education and training myself prior to going back into recruitment and obviously involved in the Chamber of Commerce. And all you hear from education pr provision is we can't fill the courses, we can't get work experience for our people. And then you hear the employers saying, you know, there's no people, I can't get people, I have no courses, there's no skills. So creating the conduit between the two was really vitally important. And in Fingal, we are a great place to live, work, visit and do business. Um, and we were ably chaired, or uh, the, the local authorities was ably chaired by Paul Reid, subsequently uh, our own Anne-Marie Farley. Um, and my attitude to life is, if not, why not? If not us, why not us? So we, we looked at all of the research that's available on a national level, particularly with the Solace Labour Market Research Unit. We um, mapped kind of the areas that would be, would be necessary, both for emergent demand and replacement demand. And it was really, really important at the inception of this project that it was replicatable, as the minister said, that the methodology was robust. So to bring all of those stakeholders together. The most important part was that the local authority is such an integral part of the community, be that the business community or in, in the context of the citizens. So to bring that together and to, to provide a secretariat for it, it was always going to have momentum if the local authority were involved. And they also paid for the uh, consultants, which was yeah. great. Um, <laughs> always helps. <laughs> Absolutely always helps. But then COVID hit and the methodology was incredibly robust. Um, and from there, we when 
last year we went on to the implementation phase and what was really, really fantastic, I saw it was everybody's desire to be involved, everybody's desire to share the workload um, and to actually say, these are my needs. I will talk to that person. I see uh, Baldoyle Training Centre now, uh, just as one tiny example, has a course on for cabinet makers. They couldn't get cabinet makers in Tierney Kitchens. And Tierney Kitchens now have a direct link to Baldoyle Training Centre and they will get traineeships out of it. And those people will have jobs. Um, and I see Frank Bride here from Aramex. He's, he's a huge supporter in Stalworth. He chairs the transportation and logistics subgroup of the... Uh, of the strategy implementation group. And he's already had fourth year students up to the, the fantastic facility in, in Ballybottle to show them what a career in transport and logistics looks like. And we've got Sinead here from, from Glen Vey as well, chairing the, the construction industry subgroup. And the amount of actions that have come out of that, the skills audits that both Natasha has facilitated and that the, the, the companies have provided, that is the link that was missing. And these things are now actually happening. And if you, if, it, if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So we're measuring and we're measuring everything. And it's fantastic to see. So really, really delighted to be here today. No, and I mean, to your point, I mean, one of my first official gigs, I suppose, as Director of Economic Development was the launch of the skills strategy in early 2019. Mm. And then I suppose we started a bit of work and then COVID hit. Do you think COVID has actually re-energised the process and made, I suppose, uh, because... A lot of industries lost a lot of staff during the pandemic for whatever reason. And did it make businesses reassess what their needs would be and just reinvigorate the whole process? And has it actually been to, to our benefit to have had that little pause? I, I found the, the minister's speech in, in the context of the lifelong learning. Uh, I think the Minister Bruton had a, a, a percentage of 15% he'd like to see people engaging with it. I'm a massive believer in lifelong learning. Um, and I actually entered my MBA through uh, recognition of prior learning. And in terms of the education system being like Tetris, my own daughter didn't do uh, very well in the leave and she hated secondary school, she hated the leave insert. But she went into uh, TU Dublin at a level six, got first class honours, so got into year three of the level eight, graduated last Tuesday with first class honours and do is doing a master's in Michael Smurfett Management Consultancy. And if you judge her on her leave insert results, you know what I mean? She, she wouldn't be doing any of those things. But I'm involved with the, the National Recruitment, Fe sorry, the Employment and Recruitment Federation. Um, I'm involved with Chambers Ireland, and obviously I run my own relatively large business. We surveyed an awful lot of people through COVID, both in Chambers Ireland and with the Employment and Recruitment Fe Federation. And we invested more in our people to get them through COVID, to give them digital skills, to give them management skills. And I sit on the Approvals and Review Committee for, for QQI, and one of the things that has to come forward is micro-credentials. Short, sharp learning interventions. Um, and the digitalization, we have Ian Hunter here who is the manager of Swords Pavilion. And Ian is just at the final stages of his MBA. And one of the things that made it more accessible was the fact that you could do it online. And those women that Minister Harris was talking about who could access lifelong learning or education intervention because of the pandemic, because you didn't have to travel, because you didn't have to get childcare. You know, I did my MBA on Friday nights and Saturday mornings, Same. and I did my assignments at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so to, 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 to have the accessibility is hugely important. And yes, it has made it far more accessible. In the Employment and Recruitment Federation, we have uh, the world's first degree programme. It's an apprenticeship degree programme in recruitment. And our next step is a master's. But what we're hoping is because it's going to be the world's first, that it'll be, that it'll be available online. Mm -hmm. And the policy, as Minister Harris suggested, needs to catch up with the innovation that's happening in business because we can use education, not only in this country, for our, our own increased participation in lifelong learning, but we can also use it as an expert. Ex export. export yeah. So we're on the, one of the, the issues with the Ukrainians coming in at the moment is that they're, they're outside the European Union, so their qualifications aren't mapped onto the I Irish framework or the European framework. So, but any of our qualifications are, I know. which means we can export them. Sorry, that's actually, that's my phone, Ethna, you wouldn't mind. Would you? <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> and I wouldn't mind, I haven't heard my phone since 2013. <laughs> so if I take you, I suppose, bring it back down to a more micro level, hmm. what are the skills 
gaps or shortages that the stakeholders that you're working with have, have identified? Well, for the moment, we, post-COVID, we weren't going to re-engage the consultants again. There's only so much money mm. I can ask the council for. True. Um, so what we decided to do was look at the areas that, that we had already identified as massive growth. Now, uh, Nora Candon from the Solace Labour Market Research Unit sits on the uh, Skills Strategy Implementation Group with us. And we also brought in uh, Mark Valentine from yeah. LinkedIn. And what we did was we did an assessment of what the needs were in, in Fingal. So post-COVID, uh, the Solace Labour Market Research Unit had done a regionalised uh, analysis of what skills were in demand and in need. And we also had our own business stakeholders. Um, and we cross-referenced that data with the LinkedIn data to give us ideas for, for what the, the greatest development was. Now, it is important that we look at construction. We look at green skills and biopharma are coming next because they're massively, massively important to, to what's coming. And the 17,000 people that are needed to retrofit homes, there's no reason that those that that's not a multiple of that yes. once you, you trans, translate it across the, the, the green sector. But we have construction because it's an immediate need. And we have transport and logistics. Green skills is coming next. Biopharma, med and tech. And then we will be looking at uh, retail and hospitality further down the line. But to, to what was most important is that we didn't do too much too quickly because it needed to have substance, it needed to have output and it needed to have engagement. So really, really thrilled that Frank, Frank Hillbride from Armex uh, chairs the transport and logistics sub, subgroup and that Sinead from Glen Vey um, chairs the construction yeah. subgroup and then we'll expand out but none of this would have been possible without the, the significant work of yourself Aoife Sheridan and Richard Walsh of the Economic Development Unit No absolutely Richard and Aoife deserve huge huge congratulations for their work and their continued work on it it's not going to go away <laughs> after today <laughs> um, I suppose just finally Siobhan um, you've talked about measurables and you know if you're not measuring you're not doing so what are the key objectives of the strategy so what you know if you had to walk away from this in a year's time, what would you have liked to have done? All I, want, all I want to happen is people to use the provision that the state is providing and paying for, to know that it's there, to know that the careers are there, to operate through the education system as if it's Tetris, because the minister's 100% right. You know, I've reskilled and gotten jobs for the long term un unemployed for payment, on a payment by results basis. I've given guidance to I don't know how many kids whose parents come to me to, to say, how am I going to access it? If we can demonstrate the effectiveness of the local authority acting as a secretariat and a driver of innovation and change, and we can bring the education sector, and that, that's the full level of the further education sector, be it... Um, the training centres, be it the skill net, be it uh, the, you know, whether it's Calester College, whether it's Closh Eder, whether it's DCU, whether it's TU Dublin, that all of the provision is known about by employers, mm -hmm. that it is directed in a way that's meaningful, that gives people the opportunity to have a successful career. It's the effectiveness that we're measuring. It's the effectiveness, the agility of the system is there, but it's through information, it's through collaboration that we can make it that it's the taxpayers' money. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mind paying tax. I say to my kids, we all, you know, somebody has to pay. We all have to pay. But what we all want is effectiveness for the use of those funds. And I, I do believe that we are assisting in that uh, objective through what we're doing in the Fingal Skills Strategy Implementation. Great. Thank you so much, Siobhan. You will agree that Siobhan has great energy. You can see very clearly demonstrated Siobhan's great energy and passion for the, all of our work in Fingal Skills. And I suppose without her leadership and drive, we wouldn't be where we are today. So a very sincere thank you to Siobhan and all the work and continued success on the work that you're doing. Um, I suppose this is a little bit of a call to action now to you all. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind connecting with... Fingal Skills Group, Skills Strategy Group on LinkedIn. It's not a group, it's a company. It's linked, it's listed as a company under uh, LinkedIn. That's how it's set up. So join it and then you'll be kept informed of all that's going on. And as Siobhan has outlined, we've kind of started with the construction sector and the transport and logistics side of things, but we are kind of evolving and moving through the different employment sectors, the green economy. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail with um, Joanne Rourke um, there. So... We're going to invite our panellists now to the stage. And I do believe, I think Minister Harris may be leaving us at this point in time. So just to sincerely thank him for his time. And I'm not sure, is the mayor leaving as well? Yeah. And to thank the mayor as well for attending today. It's really, really appreciated. And it just is a big endorsement of the work that's going on in Fingal. So thank you both. <laughs> OK, so we have two lively panel discussions this morning. Um, we've already met Siobhan. Actually, I should have told you to 
should have invited you to take a chair here, um, uh, Siobhan. But now to join Siobhan on stage, we will have uh, Frank Kilbride, who is the MD of Aramex, Natasha Kinsler, the Regional Skills Manager of the Dublin Regional Skills Forum, and Sinead Tolan, Head of HR for Glenway PLC. I should have got you to stay. So you can back up. Yeah. <laughs> There's no prescribed seating, so sit wherever you're comfortable, folks. Good morning, Ola, and you're all very welcome. Um, Siobhan is a hard act to follow, so um, I, hope, I hope you've had um, a couple of uh, lozenges and get the voices ready for lots of talking now, okay? Um, so we'll start with you, Frank. Um, Aramix is a big, big operation. I've had the privilege of being out to visit with you and seen it in action. What are the skills challenges that you're currently facing um, in specifically to your own business and just more broadly in the transport and logistics sector? Thanks, Seymour. Yeah, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today to meet you all. Just very briefly, Aramex are a logistics and transportation company. Um, we're based locally here in Ballybuckle, about 180 staff in the island of Ireland. We'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about that in a second. Globally, the, the company has about 18,000 people employed and we've about 10 million uh, square meters of facilities around the globe. So uh, we help people move stuff from A to B. It's, it's, it's logistics, transport, and it's uh, in, been in the news as an industry. So uh, the greatest challenge locally facing us at the moment, as you can probably guess, has been Brexit related mm -hmm. and uh, trying to find staff to help with customs clearances and to facilitate the movement of goods, primarily from UK to Ireland, uh, but we also move goods internationally. But the scale of movements and the customs requirements has been just really, really uh, challenging. And uh, that's that's the key, I suppose, thing that we're looking at today. But there's, there's a huge shortage in the industry for drivers, uh, for warehouse folk, and for, I suppose, cross skills and trying to train people into new roles, new new positions. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty to talk about, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. And Sinead, I suppose maybe I probably should give you all the opportunity to introduce your what your role is within your own company. And then I suppose the question to you would be, what are the challenges facing the construction industry today? So, um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm head of HR for Glenvay Glen Properties, and I suppose it's um, no secret the problems that are, are that we face for with skills um, in the construction industry um, across the board, really, both on site and for support um, uh, roles in, in the office. Um, so from quantity surveyors, engineers, right across to those support in IT, marketing. So it's the actual pool of uh, people in the construction industry is not growing at the pace that the demand for, for construction is growing at. OK, and I suppose a question to both yourself and Frank. What's your experience of um, having worked with the Skills Strategy Implementation Group over the last year? You know, what are your kind of key takeaways from that so far? It's great to uh, collectively look at where the gaps are and build programs, you know, to support that. Um, I think having the construction um, side to it, breakaway, um, is also good because we can focus on what the issues are. And you're not alone, and you have the the educators and trainers there to help and to plan, you know, so where our gaps are, we know that in the future that we're working on it, we're, we're going to close those gaps. Yeah, in a word, it's been great. Um, it's, it's been really, um, I would say, enlightening because the collaboration between local uh, providers, education providers, uh, the council itself, um, your own offices, Emer, and from businesses that, that would traditionally, I suppose, compete with us. But that, I suppose, interaction, um, the discussion around what common needs are, you know, you think you're, you're kind of unique, but you're not. Um, and I suppose the greatest thing I've got out of it is the understanding of the availability of courses uh, the supports, you know, the educational possibilities for for staff or folk that work with us has been has been tremendous. So uh, yeah, it's been great, great experience. And thanks to you, Siobhan, for for asking me on. So great. Um, 
Natasha, to you. Um, if you could explain, I suppose, to this group, uh, what exactly is the Dublin Regional Skills Forum, uh, Forum and what is it that you do? Delighted. Thank you, Emer, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and as well to acknowledge Siobhan as the driver, the key driver in Furness. I'm only delighted and it's a pleasure to work within this group. But I suppose the Regional Skills Fora, obviously we are under the structure of the Department of Further and Higher Education, as the Minister has said. But this is a structure that's emulated around the country. So it's a national structure. But I obviously manage Dublin. And I think what's unique about Dublin is while the, the fora exists and all the stakeholders, all the educational providers, Dublin is very unique because not alone the landscape with over 82,000 active businesses, it's quite a landscape to try and navigate. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there is the beauty of Dublin as well is that we have seven higher education providers and I have to mention Jared there, he's here from DCU. You can't <laughs> not escape it. And equally in the room, we have representation from our further education. Both DDL ETB and City of Dublin ETB are in the room as well. And I think what, as Frank has alluded to, I call myself the conduit as well in the wider landscape of Dublin. The beauty of the Fingal is even at a more local level, but it's, it's emulating the same approach we're doing in the wider Dublin. So the focus, we have four key focuses. One is the engagement piece. And again, Siobhan mentioned it. What's key here is to specifically target those SMEs. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have a HR capacity to be able to navigate that system. But equally, and Frank pointed it out, when I meet with the larger organizations and we actually delve in because we offer a one service of this skills audit Siobhan mentioned. And what's surprising is when you actually get down to the granular level of what the skills is, there is two quite distinct features. And both Sinead and Frank have mentioned it. One is the talent gap. Yeah. And that's bringing new recruits in. But then you also have the employees that are currently employed who are now required, particularly because of COVID, who are transitioning into a very different space, who require a very different element of upskilling. So you have the two cohorts, but to navigate and try and find out where that provision exists that's the role that we do. And it's amazing when you talk to companies. I mean, I've conducted both skills audits and it's amazing the amount of information that we've outlined on state funded provision that the organizations didn't know yeah. exists. Yeah. And to Siobhan's point, every organization is paying into that national training fund. Yet for a large portion, they are not availing back of that state funded provision. And that's the key we want to make sure. The amount of companies I talk to who are bringing in private consultants and paying a fortune for actually what exists. But again, to the minister's point, the vast gambit of what exists that is now flexible and the opportunity to tailor it specifically because of those conversations is a key element to meeting those outcomes that the businesses are identifying. So the communication and the awareness piece is a key element. The specific engagement piece is a key element. But the, the great opportunity within the Fingal piece is the subsector groups. And what I bring to the table is the national view, because it's not that different when you look at the landscape in Dublin. What's going on at the national is very similar to the local regional level. But we need to ensure we're not replicating or duplicating anything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So those are the key elements that I think we, we, we try and support, if you like, the businesses. So delighted to do so. That's hugely insightful, uh, Natasha. And I suppose I'm probably of great a piece of information for the audience here today because again not everybody knows what is available and that's we're hearing it time and time again we've heard it at a micro level in Balbriggan um, where we would have a very specific piece of work going on and people didn't know that the DDL ETP existed in that space you know and um, Siobhan we have two of the key sectors uh, skills gap sectors re represented here this morning you alluded to a couple of other sectors that you see where her skills are uh, gaps are emerging or are present can you talk me through a couple of those? Yeah, I, 
to the Minister's point about um, climate change being the, the biggest disaster that we face, um, green skills, you know, whether it's you're looking at sustainable development goals with the United Nations, if you're looking for retrofitting of homes, if you're looking for reducing our carbon footprint in all different different elements, and it's not just one industry, which is really, really interesting about the green skills, it's going to transverse and um, all sectors of the economy, and that is something that we're, we're, we're putting an awful lot of effort into at the moment. Um, and Richard has done an awful lot of research on what is needed in those areas um, in order that we can bring the right stakeholders together to plan for that. But the, that sectoral subgroup is going to be of vital importance. Even, you know, I know without houses, but the, the, the green skills are going to be necessary in construction, they're going to be necessary in transport and logistics, in terms of, you know, fuel management. It, 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 there's so many different areas. Um, so that's going to be a really, really substantial group. And then in terms of the... The landscape in Fingal, we've got four different economies going on within Fingal. Um, we are going to have to look at um, pharmaceutical and med and tech as well into the future. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is very much that we're focusing on long term skills that add the most value that we can do something about very, very quickly. But there's, there's quite a roadmap. I actually don't see, I just keep seeing the momentum of this building and moving into more areas. And as each subgroup progresses and we get more would you say, effective or sharper at scaling the provision, developing new courses, bring it, you know, because the stakeholders that are involved, the educators, all they're trying to do is find provision that will give learners jobs. Absolutely. So these connections to the employers, it's, it's like manna from heaven because you're finding out exactly what's needed. You have people who will take your people for work experience. You have the possibility of a permanent uh, employment for all of these people. Just, that's all the, our educators want. That's all our providers want. So just to, to bring it together is hugely important. But another piece that, that the, the local authority add to it is something as simple as a local link mm. for transport. You know, that by bringing those things together, like we, we were talking to Frank previously about trying to get into the, the secondary schools. Well, the local authority has uh, an officer that, that's engaged in, in outreach for those. You add to that a bus service. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, employment or education becomes far more attainable for people that previously thought that they're excluded from it. So I, I just see the momentum continuing to build. Great. Um, and like, I suppose we're seeing it as well within the local authority system and um, in fairness, uh, the chief executive was quite, quite visionary, I suppose, in setting up an active travel and climate action department specifically because of the green challenges that are hitting the local authority as a public service um, sector body. But that then translates. But within that, there's a skill set that's required. I don't know whether there are degree programmes for those as yet or you know what I mean they're evolving or whatever it might be for our engineering staff to reskill and that lifelong learning piece as well so it's all interwoven and stitched together so Sinead um, obviously we hear about the construction sector all the time on the news uh, we hear about it from our minister uh, Dara O'Brien about housing for all and you know the challenges there are apprenticeships an issue for the sector are you recruiting you know as a sector is there appetite there or what's the gap Absolutely. They're a fundamental requirement to um, build our houses, to reach those targets. And it's just critical that we attract our parents, I'd say, back, because um, the numbers have dropped. There's no doubt about it. And I welcome the changes that have been made by the minister. It's excellent to see that progress. And I think... Um, the, the huge change that we need in, in the how it's viewed, it's so significant to our industry to, to achieve our targets. Um, and it's a very significant career, a job, you know, and that it's viewed that way. And I suppose to convince parents and to convince the, um, the students themselves that it is a, a, a good direction to go and it's not just about the CAO we really welcome that because that I think I won't th there has been um and I the ideal was um presumed to be you know college or a degree course when this can be a very substantial um job for young people you know four years and not everyone wants to sit in the classroom this is an opportunity to be outdoors and to to learn as you go um, so it's absolutely fundamental to our industry that that we get people back into apprentice. I suppose I'm building on that then, I suppose, Frank and Sinead, 
how or what can both of your sectors do to encourage uh, more school leavers into apprentices, you know, just at a very practical level, you know, so the minister's talking about incentives and all the rest, but actually getting in and talking to the kids at, sco at school leaver level, what, ca what can your industry do specifically to try and address that? I think uh, uh, the Fingal school strategy is, um, has been massively important for us. We were visiting schools um, ourselves, but to have that, again, the collaborative approach, you know, um, and that th we have the educators there and, and um, backing that. Um, but it, it's the awareness, it's the absolute bringing the awareness to, as I said, not just the students, but parents, because parents have to be convinced that that's the right direction for their, their children to go as well. Yeah, for sure. The industry, our industry is possibly a little bit of a bad rap because a, a lot of people don't know what we do and there is an association with, you know, the, the driving times, the hours, and everything else for that. So there's an, an, an onus on the industry to change that perception. And a lot of the jobs are technological jobs. There's financial, you know, and there's a huge amount of support work as done as well as the primary, which is the movement and handling of the goods. So I think we as a group need to communicate that better explain what those roles are, those opportunities are. But, you know, Siobhan said earlier on, going to schools and talking to um, school children about what we do, what the possibilities are, explain the, the industry, to try and encourage them to learn a little bit more about it, uh, show them the facilities where, where it's possible, and uh, get them to talk to folk who are working in the, in the business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody started somewhere. Um, to come out of school, it isn't absolutely essential, as you said a few times, that, you know, you go through university. And the thing is, there are pathways for, for kids to come out of school, to start work, and then to grow into further education. And I think we've also a job to do with maybe career guidance folk, yeah. you know, to say that, that, look, this industry provides possibilities, that they're local jobs, um, there is, you know, a real chance of development. And I think that's been one of the issues we've had maybe that people come in and say, you know, well, where do I go with this job? Yeah. And the amount of um, guys and gals that have gone from, you know, from say introduction into the warehouses onwards probably hasn't been great or good enough. And I think that's something we need to change. And the amount of people that came from non-logistics transport industries for the customs roles uh, during the pandemic, as an introduction to Brexit, uh, we got folk from retail, from tourism, and catering, you know, that, that industries that had uh, seen a severe drop off in employment. And these were alternative jobs, good jobs. They're, they've been well trained. Uh, retainment is now the issue, as I think, you know, as the guys alluded to. So that's about further development. What, what courses can we get them to do? What advice can we give them? And um, yeah, I think we've a bit to do as an industry, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's true to schools. I would start there. Yeah, I think yeah, everything is reaching kids at a young age and just, you know, demystifying the whole process. And I think the minister had wrote down, I think Tetris several times, Siobhan, so you'll see it quoted back to you probably on, uh, in national media in the, in the, in the near future. But it, that is exactly it. It is a Tetris of opportunities for children to access employment and education and no one size fits all, which I think is becoming abundantly clear. Siobhan, um, next steps. OK, we've a group of really engaged people here in the audience, so our, uh, on the panel. So next steps for the skill strategy. Where where do you see this group going? We've only just begun. Um, we've only just begun. So the, the the relationships, the collaboration, as Sinead alluded to, you know, program development. Uh, where we've everybody's getting to know each other and, and we, we are seeing tangibles already but these relationships are going to deepen the, the direction of the provision is going to be more targeted the effectiveness and people coming out the other side the, we're, we're going to continue moving until we're, we're, we're telling you career stories and you know sectoral changes that you know I didn't know this existed we saw so much of it during COVID even in our own business we, we, we when hospitality crashed we transferred a massive amount of people into transport and logistics. We, we transferred a ma massive amount of people into healthcare because we gave them the training free of charge because we, we had the ability to do that in our own immediate needs. But th that kind of thing is what has to start happening. So for, for us, I think you're just going to find that we're going to have more effective subgroups that are targeted to specific niche areas. And that the next time that we come back to visit you, it's going to be the success stories of what we've, we've achieved.
Yeah, won't it be fantastic to showcase, you know, a couple of individuals that have come through education or have started on their pathway to kind of lifelong learning and, and employment in tandem? Won't that just be a fantastic outcome for the for the strategy to have achieved? Um, Natasha, I suppose from the Dublin Regional Skills Forum point of view, what is your ambition for the skills strategy and how can you see it helping the work that you're doing on a Dublin regional level? Yeah, I mean, just to say as well, and, and to note, Aoife sits on the fora, so there's a direct link, and in fairness to Richard, I'd say I'm hounding him every day, <laughs> and he's just phenomenal to get the groupings and the discussion going. I think to Siobhan's point, while it's, it's started and there's progress been made, the reality is that business changes and skills are changing constantly. So for me, that sustainability element, because each time you meet with a company, a different need arises. What's short term, medium and long term has to be sustained in these discussions. And even just to the conversations about the school leavers and directing in, it needs to have nearly more than just the visits. Because we find even in the sectors, when you think about it, and the development of the apprenticeship in particular, who would have thought a couple of years ago, there's apprenticeships in logistics and transport. You know, there's been traditionally the craft, but there is so much more on offer right up to level 10. The other scenarios is the PLCs. I mean, that's another cohort that I remind businesses when they talk about trying to access talent pools. They traditionally think about the graduate after the four-year degree. I started at PLC level. And that's a cohort in itself that are only open to getting into the space on work-based learning. That's where the apprenticeship, the traineeships, all those offer give a direct talent pipeline right now, but they can progress then through what's on offer at higher education through the likes of Springboard. Micro-credentials is another piece. The key element here is that business, though, needs to continue to feed in an yep. input. Yep. Because the deliverables will only work where the businesses are actually feeding into what they need. And when we talk about that need, it's at a really granular level. What it looks like, what it's delivering on, is it a short term, is it a longer term, is it a micro-credential that could be stackable? So it's all those elements that need to continue and sustain because business is going to continually change and skills, therefore, is going to continually change. OK, look, panel, thank you so, so much for your, um, to our panellists for a really stimulating conversation, giving us an awful lot to thank. So I want to very much thank Sinead Tolan, Head of HR uh, for Glenvay PLC, Natasha Kinsler from the Regional Skills Manager, Dublin Regional Skills Forum, Frank Cabride, Kent, Country Manager of Aramex, and Siobhan Kinsler, Chair of our Fingal Skills Implementation Group and Director of the Knoll Group. So look, thank you so much to you all. You've given us really, really insightful um, I suppose, great insight into what the real challenges are for your in respective industries and how we might bridge those gaps. So look, I'd like to invite you to take your seats again. Thank you so much. Um, so I think you'll all agree that's a really interesting conversation. And I suppose what it's, what it's highlighted to me is that the sector is really agile. You know, the skills sector is really agile and it's reacting and responding the whole time to what business needs. But I suppose the key piece then is to elevate and augment the business voice so that the sector can continue to respond and we can hear um, what those needs are and have them articulated and transformed into opportunities and learning opportunities. I am delighted now to welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Larry, Mary Liz Trant, Director of the National Apprenticeship Offices, who's going to speak to us again about other opportunities that are there and the work that her fine office are doing. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Emer. Uh, good morning, everybody. Absolutely delighted to be here um, and have an opportunity to speak to you a bit about um, what's going on, the really exciting things that are going on in apprenticeship. And thanks very much to, to colleagues right across further and higher education who are in the room as well, who work so hard on the ground with employers, with apprentices, um, and providing really good um, skills training. 
Um, the, the title, I suppose, just talking to Aoife and, and colleagues in Fingal County Council, you know, of, of just my talk or just my short talk this morning is unlocking potential and delivering talent. And obviously we've heard so much this morning about that, about, you know, the, the, I suppose what, what, the, what the solutions are to actually making that happen and making that happen in a really vibrant area and community like Fingal. Um, just to give you a sense, and, and the minister mentioned some of the figures, you know, we've, we've a really vibrant population of apprentices in this country at this stage. We've 24,000 apprentices. That's, you know, as big as some of our biggest higher education institutions um, uh, actually employed at the moment, doing training, uh, completing their qualifications. And as was mentioned, um, awards go from level five up to level 10. Level 10 is PhD. We have our first principal engineer apprenticeship, which is offered, led by University of Limerick. Um, and then a whole range of it's a 64 uh, programs on offer at this stage. We'll have a 65th next week. Uh, Frank will be very happy to hear. It's uh, commercial driving and transport operations, which adds to a suite of logistics, apprenticeships, um, logistics, and supply chain management. Um, so a really dynamic pipeline and we have about another, there's a, over 25 more coming down the track. So within about five years, we probably won't be far off having 100 apprenticeship programmes on offer, um, which is, you know, we're actually getting up to the point of some of the other countries in Europe, like Germany, like Switzerland, who have apprenticeship as an absolutely key part of their education and training system and of their talent development. Um, 8, 8, 000, over 8,400 employers in the country using apprenticeship. While that's grown very significantly uh, over the last number of years, we had just over 3,000 seven years ago. Um, I think it was Natasha, uh, it was a Siobhan or uh, Emer, somebody mentioned 82,000 businesses in Dublin alone. So if you look at that, that's, that's just 10% of the Dublin businesses, let alone the whole country. So I suppose our sense of it is that this number could, can, can and should and needs to grow very significantly who are tapping into apprenticeship. We've got 16 industries and I'm naming a few of them there. And in a minute, I'll just talk about some of the ones that we had picked out kind of in preparing for this morning that are of particular interest to employers in Fingal. There was mention of the National Training Fund. So there's actually over 200 million invested annually at this stage in apprenticeship, mainly from the National Training Fund, which employers are paying into um, their PRSI and then also by the Exchequer. Um, the, you're all aware um, of, you know, the, the, there's the, an action plan for apprenticeship that Minister ha Harris published last year. And um, one of the big kind of enablers, I suppose, is setting up the, this new National Apprenticeship Office, which I have the, the privilege of, of leading for the first couple of years. Um, and the whole idea is that, it, you know, to move towards this idea of a really uh, coherent, single apprenticeship system that's easy to access for both employers and for potential apprentices and easy for parents and for, you know, for the wider public to understand. Um, and I suppose really, I suppose, get a sense of how the, the, the opportunities that are provided through this route. Um, I mentioned there just the... Um, uh, and, and I think the minister mentioned it too, there is a target of 750 apprenticeship places um, through civil and public service bodies, including the local authorities. And talking to Emer earlier on this morning and Aoife, you know, they're, they're, Fingal is active in this, in this area and I know very keen to actually employ apprentices itself. It is a key, it's going to be a key signal, even though 750 places over the next number of years is, is relatively small in the overall population, but very significant in terms of the job opportunities, that sense of confidence uh, in the apprenticeship system. Um, and, and just that last point, and, and the, it's been coming up constantly this morning and even some of the conversations I've had with people before, before we started, just that need to, I suppose, build that understanding right across the board, right across Irish society of apprenticeship as a highly valued career path and mode of learning. You'll all have heard it, you know, and, and even we're still grappling ourselves with some of those perceptions. Who is apprenticeship for? You know, who in school is going to be steered towards an apprenticeship? And maybe that sense that, you know, sometimes it was more about, you know, uh, you know, oh, somebody's not going to go to college and apprenticeship is an opportunity. Actually, what employers are saying and need to get more vocal on is they want the best possible talent. And apprentices are developing skills, learning, 
and really valuable work experience. It's a mode of learning, no more, no less. And it's getting our heads around that in Ireland. We're making progress, but we still have a long way to go. And that sense of, you know, there isn't a higher value placed on different types of learning. Um, and that's so important for our young people and for people who want to change careers as well, who are maybe in work. Just the, the um, you know, the, 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 there, there is this huge investment now by government. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the real opportunity now is to actually mobilise all of those voices. And I think Fingal County Council, and being pro so proactive with your skills strategy, strategy, you have that real influence, I suppose, in Fingal, but also with your fellow local authorities as well. We just picked out a couple of the, um, the potential apprenticeships. There's actually 10 areas that straight away, when I looked at the skills strategy that Siobhan and colleagues worked on, um, uh, just the, the, you know, those areas, those skills areas, those I think there were six core industry sectors for growth, uh, including green. You know, there's construction, obviously, a really big one. Um, Siobhan mentioned there's motor, there's biopharma, logistics, uh, international finance, insurance, accounting, accounting in, in there, hairdressing, hospitality and food, and sales and marketing. Do you, uh, there's a retail apprenticeship, which is really um, has taken off. The first graduation of apprentices is later on, is next month in Athlone. There are over 300 retail supervisor apprentice, apprentices now in the system, hugely valued, um, and the industry is delighted with it. I think Frank mentioned that work, you know, to build that sense of careers in, in a particular industry industry um, and just that sense, you know, that confidence that parents have and potential entrants to the industry have. If I go in here, regardless of what level I'm at, there is an opportunity for me to progress, be successful in that career. And I think that's a huge part of, you know, that work that employ uh, industry and education and training providers can do together. Um, just to mention, and again, I think the minister uh, mentioned it, there's that apprenticeship employer grant. This is for the, from next week, 40 apprenticeship programmes that don't get a training allowance as part of the, you know, it's, it, the, the craft get a, a training allowance from the state payment contribution. So there's this, um, uh, from next month, employers will be able to claim uh, uh, this 2,000 payment per apprentice per year. Um, and the, the vision in the, in the action plan for apprenticeship is that over time, we'll move to this approach where every employer will get this contribution towards the salary of their apprentice per year. Um, to recognise, you know, particularly the smaller, the micro and the smaller companies, wh which are so um, significant in Ireland, and that, that support for them to take on and invest in their, in their talent pipeline. There was mention of women, um, and if you look at where we were in 2015, we had 26 female apprentices in the entire um, in, in the entire. At the time, there was about there was about 10,000 apprentices in the population. That grew then to you know 341 2018, 1500 then this year, um, and we really want to move the dial on that. What's, what those figures are hiding is the fact that craft apprenticeships, the numbers are still very low. There's still only about 1% of craft apprentices are women. There are about, there are eight, last count, eight apprenticeship programmes where there isn't a single woman. Um, I think Dermot's in the room from the Construction Industry Federation. Dermot and colleagues have done a lot of work on just changing that and, you know, highlighting the, the opportunity that is there. But we have a lot more to do. Um, and we just just last uh, earlier uh, this month, we announced this the new gender based bursary for employers where um, on, on all of those uh, apprenticeships where numbers are really low, um, there's an, a payment of two thousand six hundred and sixty six euro for each female apprentice that's taken on. And that's in addition to the employer grant. So it's, it's a pretty significant contribution and support by the state, I suppose, to, to, to really invest in apprenticeship and encourage employers to invest as well. Um, there was mention of the CAO and how this is starting to give a level of visibility to apprenticeship and all of the options, you know, apprenticeship, further and higher education. And the minister mentioned the button and there's the three options people will see when they go on to the CAO. We're delighted with the start this year. You know, the, the apprenticeship options went on the CAO platform in November. We've had uh, over 20, nearly 27,500 click-throughs from the CAO website into the apprenticeship website um, since November. 
and we set up a free phone helpline um, for, for anybody who wants advice on apprenticeship. We've had over 500 calls, uh, probably could, you know, you know and, and that's been increasing month on month. We started off with 60, we've had over 100 over the last number of months. A lot of calls from parents, from teachers, from guidance counsellors. And the big thing is, I actually have lots of people or I know somebody or there's somebody who really wants an apprenticeship, where do I go? So I think it very much speaks to Natasha's point and Siobhan's point about that connection. You know, employers going, I need people, where are they? Young people going, I really want an opportunity, where is it? And figuring out how do we really build that and make that as easy as possible. We're not there yet. We aren't. And, you know, there's a stand outside with my colleague Jeanette and we'll be out there afterwards. And, you know, I think it's about, you know, finding ways to help make those connections, help people find out where the information is. Frank comes out and says, OK, I want to take on potentially five logistics apprentices. Let, you know, helping Frank and colleagues in Aramex figure out, OK, where do I go with this? How do I actually progress that or the new apprenticeship, for example? And, you know, making it as simple and accessible as possible. Just that point, I suppose, and just, you know, just that gap between what people think they know and the 21st century reality and opportunity. Two different conversations I had this morning. There wasn't that awareness that there are 64 programs now available. Um, and that's, to me, that's kind of, oh, jeepers, that's, you know, we, we need to really step up here. That's a, that's a challenge for, you know, us on the education and training side, the National Apprenticeship Office. We need to figure out how to get the word out. We need to really promote that and, and get that option much more visible. Um, and also that debate, that challenge about who apprenticeships are for. It's for the best talent. It's for people who are going to really, f you know, uh, embrace that work-based opportunity. And at the end of the day, it's just one way of getting your qualification. Um, yeah, and, and just I suppose that's, I think uh, somebody was saying, I think Emer, you were asking, uh, you know, what, what, you know, somebody, what would they want to do by the end of this? I think for me, the first, the early achievement of this new National Apprenticeship Office is actually getting to that point where we have that universal pride and confidence in apprentices, in apprenticeship, um, and among that community, it's, it is now <coughs> over 40,000, if you, you know, including apprentices, employers, education and training providers, and it's growing all the time. Just to finish up, and just the last couple of slides, um, Just this is actually a group of apprentices and apprentice graduates, and Brendan there, um, some of you will, have no, will know Brendan Kearns. This is a group from Designer Group, one of the um, uh, uh, construction companies working in Dublin, um, who've actually been hugely supportive in getting the word out about the value and the benefit and the opportunity of apprenticeship. This photograph is actually taken in Fingal, in Hoth, in the Bailey. You can just see the lighthouse there in the background. And this is a campaign that we, we, we've been working on uh, over the last three to four years. Um, uh, you know, a competition with uh, these three dimensional A's. This was one that Designer Group created um, just to showcase the skill and the talent of our Irish apprentices. Um, and I suppose the fantastic experience for me and for colleagues was seeing how much those apprentices loved showing what they could do, showing off what they could do. And, and really, I suppose that just that um, talent that's there, that backbone of our economy, of our society, um, you know, and, and we've heard about it this morning, housing for all, climate action, you know, there are that th this this pipeline of, of young people and older people are going to be so important for us over the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, I think the the stories um, the examples, the visual, the sort of seeing, this is just another shot in the same, the same location, seeing, I suppose, just how, um, how, just how skilled our, our, you know, our apprentices are, that population coming through, and hearing people like Brendan and others who've come through the apprenticeship route talking about the opportunity that they've had, the success they've had, you know, and just spreading the word on that. So I think ev everybody has a contribution to make, everybody in this room, Fingal County Council, you know, really influential. And I think as, you know, we start to, you know, we're walking the walk on these things. The numbers are growing. The local authorities are taking on people. Employers are giving feedback saying, this is working for me. 
um, this has worked for me personally, but this is working for me for my for my for my employee for my 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 workplace and my my business. Um, and I think somebody was talking about retention. We haven't got any Irish research yet, but there's lots of global research which shows that people who come through and are trained in a company, they want to give back. They stay longer. Retention is much less of an issue. And specifically apprenticeship, on average, they stay five years in a company um, in, in some countries. That they've, that, you know, that's measured research. We'll be doing that research in Ireland. We're, you know, that's one of the things that we, need, we want to do now this year, once we get fully up and running. Um, a lot of, you know, we want to survey employers and get this feedback and really start to feed back that evidence about how apprenticeship is working. Um, so look, that's it. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks very much to, to Ema and Aoife and look forward to speaking later. And uh, there's, uh, we have our stand outside booklet with all the 64 options in it and delighted to speak to you either today or at a later stage. All the contact details are there. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary, Mary Liz. Um, I suppose our next phase of uh, the morning we'll kind of talk a little bit more about um, the skill strategy and just the, the higher education piece and how all that stitches in as well but in we're very sustainably focused in Fingal and we have a sustainable Fingal program which is a program for helping businesses become more sustainable with the green agenda and I suppose in keeping with that strategy we're also measuring our CO2 emissions uh, from today's event and offsetting with tree planting and we're planting 850 trees um, on the back of today's event and um, so you know we're, we're doing our little bit to give back. Um, again if you are going to tweet please use the hashtag Fingal skill strategy and now I'm Absolutely delighted, and she's not thanking me for this at all, in welcoming my colleague, uh, Aoife Sheridan, uh, to the podium. Aoife is um, my Senior Executive Officer in Economic Development and has actually been the driver of this um, with Richard and the team, uh, working very closely with Siobhan and um, all of the members of the implementation group. And without her, this event wouldn't be happening today. So Aoife is going to talk you through um, our new skills portal, um, which is really why we're here today. We did the strategy launch back in 2019. So this is work in action now. So over to you, Aoife. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emer, And thanks very much, everyone, for coming today. We're delighted to see so many people here. As Emer said, um, I have responsibility for driving the implementation of the Fingal Skills Strategy. And that group has been up and running for a little bit more than a year now, um, despite the slight hiccup with COVID. Um, and from a local authority perspective, it's it's been a fascinating journey for us in terms of discovery, awareness and collaboration. Um, and, you know, it, it's been great to hear the conversations that have been happening outside as well. It's, you know, it's showing what collaboration really can be, making those connections outside. So delighted that so many people came today. In terms of what we've been delivering for the Skills Strategy Implementation Group, it became clear very quickly um, just how much is on offer from uh, the education and training providers. It's a veritable sea of information and that can be quite difficult to navigate, um, especially for businesses and SMEs who don't have the time to be wading through all the information that's out there and just to find exactly what they need in terms of skills and trainings. So a key deliverable for the group was to develop a skills hub, a one-stop shop drawing together all the various strands of information that are that's available into a kind of an easy to access portal. And as the minister said earlier, um, you don't want to hide the information. We're trying to uncover it here. We're not trying to recreate the wheel. You're not going to find any new information really on, on this portal. A lot of it is just trying to make it easier to navigate and helping people to uh, actually wade through the information to find what they need. So today I'd like to share with you for the first time the, the Fingal Skills Hub, which is hosted on the uh, Fingal County Council website, you can see the, the website there, www.fingal.ie slash business slash dash hub. Um, so this is what we've been working on to deliver and we've been working very hard with all the education providers to pull together the vast amount of courses and information on, on PLC courses, apprenticeships, everything that we can find, we're trying to put here onto this web page. So what can you actually find on this page? Just going to take a quick look at it now. Uh, in terms of what's there for employers, we have links to identify skills gaps, how to upskill your employees, how you can take on apprentices and what the benefits to doing an apprenticeship is, what supports are available if you're hiring the long-term unemployed. So we'll just click into one of those links and delve a little deeper to see what's there. Um, the, 
the link to the Dublin Regional Skills Forum. So if you click into that link, you're going to find information about how you can get a skills audit for your business and lots more information there. And obviously, Natasha Kinsella, the Dublin Regional Skills Forum manager, is here with us today. And uh, she was on our panel earlier on. So uh, if that's something that's interesting to you, I, I know she'd be happy to talk to you at, at one of the breaks. So moving on then. What's, what's there for uh, people who are looking for a job or looking to upskill for a new job? So there's lots of information there. I'm only showing a small snapshot of, of it there, but if we click into one of them there for apprenticeships, we can drill down and just see a little bit more information on the various apprenticeship schemes that are available. So I highly recommend people, now that that website is up and live on Fingal County Council's website, that you click into it uh, and you explore it a little bit. We also have information there on the skill strategy itself, which you can download, and the work of the implementation group, which is being led by Siobhan Kinsler, our chair. So we also have an event for news and events. So you'll see various links there later on today. We'll update that with today's event here. And uh, you'll see there as well a, a link on information to the Balbriggan Loves Learning Festival, which has been happening out in Balbriggan all of this week as well. So that is the website that we've been working very hard to, uh, to deliver. Um, so what's next for the, for the Skills Hub and this website? Um, this is very much where all of you today come in. And we have two asks of you here today. The first is feedback. Uh, we really want to continue to develop this website, so we would love to get your feedback on the website and you know, what have we missed, what do we need to update. Um, if you have new courses, new provision that you would like to highlight, we would definitely like to hear from you so we can include that information there and push that message out to the people who need to hear it. The website is really, it's, it's a wayfinding post. It's, it's directing people to the information that they need for, for businesses and employees and job seekers. So we're going to need the help of the education and training providers to keep that content fresh and up to date. So any feedback that you're, you're willing to give us, we would be absolutely delighted to have so that we can make the site better and even more user friendly. Um, the second ask is for you to join the Fingal Skills Strategy Group. We have a great range of stakeholders involved already from the sectors that we've mentioned, from transport and logistics and construction, but we'd love more people to join those uh, subgroups so that we can assist more businesses and, and find out what their needs are and help to address those. And we also want to address uh, the skills in new sectors. We want to expand out into biopharma, green skills, uh, retail, hospitality, or some of the sectors that we want to look at this year and next year. So if anybody is interested in joining the Fingal Skills Strategy, I do hope you'll get in touch with us and thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Emer. Thank you, Aoife. And I know, um, I mean, that's kind of a snapshot of the website and what its, what its capability will be. But again, as Aoife said, it'll be led by your interaction and I suppose providing information so that we can showcase it there. There's probably, probably a little bit more tidying up to be done and all the rest on it and make it a bit more user friendly. But it's a great start and it's just good to have a central hub of all the data. Aoife, am I right in thinking if, if they don't get to talk to you today, if they email econdev at fingal.ie will be the best web, or best email address to contact the team on if anybody's interested in joining up um, with the various subgroups of the skills implementation um, side of things. Okay, um, I'm really delighted um, to be welcoming um, Steve Curran um, to the stage now. Steve is the Commercial Director for NEP UK and Ireland. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hey. <laughs> still, we're still in the morning. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you? Great. Uh, it's lovely to meet Thanks you. For us. So, tell well, first of all, tell me what N NEP UK in Ireland is okay. and what you do. Okay, so NEP, uh, I'll give you an overall thing. Uh, NEP is a, a large US company that has now branched out across the world. So, there's about 24 different countries across the globe where we are the main broadcast uh, facility <laughs> provider for most networks across the globe, broadcasters, etc., cetera. Uh, we look after things from uh, World Cup, the Oscars, uh, Premiership League in the UK, uh, then uh, what else, the World Cup, everything, the Euros, uh, everything you kind of see on TV, you wouldn't really see our name because we're behind the broadcasters. So we look after that, so we have an awful lot of engineers. We have over 4,000 staff uh, across the globe just on a permanent basis, and then the freelance fraternity goes up to about 25,000 above that. So it, it's, it's, it's a big entity. Now, what they did is they came into Ireland about six years ago, and they bought a company called uh, Observe, which was an outside broadcast company in, in Wicklow. 
Um, there's some of the stats there. Um, you can, it's, they bought an outside broadcast in a company in Wicklow, uh, which was looking after predominantly uh, RTE and uh, TV3, looked after a lot of their sport content, entertainment content. So what we've done since that, we've broadened out everything. So we look after now uh, all the URC rugby that you see on TV, all the uh, Six Nations that you see on TV all comes through us. Um, from Italy, UK, Ireland, our trucks kind of spread out and drive across Europe. So we look after that. Even then things like the, which you won't see, which is the uh, the World Ice Hockey Championships this month from oh, Finland. Right. The trucks head up there today. So thing, so we do an awful lot. We spread out and we touch an awful lot around the globe. This is Ireland. So you can see where we have six offices, mostly around Dublin, uh, our, where our staff is at the moment, which is growing as well. Uh, these are the companies that we have in this country. So there's NEP Ireland, which was where I work, which is which the OB companies, uh, the trucks that go out and film all the different events. Uh, Screen Scene is our post-production facility. So that is based in Mount Street. There's three buildings in there. Uh, they do post-production on um, things from Gogglebox to First States Ireland uh, and then every other show that kind of goes through uh, RTE and TV3. Uh, they then do specialty shows that go off to the States, so we're doing a lot of network shows for the States at the moment. Um, the, the Big Deal, all those kind of shows. But basically what they're, the biggest thing they're doing at the moment is VFX. So they have 80 people working for them in the VFX department in Main Street. Uh, they look after all the special effects for Disney and a lot of the Marvel movies that you're seeing come out at the moment, they look after all the special effects for that. So you wouldn't really see that, except you look at the small print of the credits. Um, CT is used to be Ion, uh, NEP bought it about two years ago. They look after uh, a lot of corporate events. They do service agreements uh, with Microsoft. So they look after everything in, in the Microsoft building. Uh, the signs that you see around the dart stations, the big LEDs, they look after all that. So that's that kind of world that goes on. Uh, NEP Connect uh, is only started last month. Uh, it, in Ireland, it's been in the UK. So basically, uh, all around Ireland, we ha now have a fibre infrastructure uh, where we have fibre optic cables that run from every URC rugby venue, uh, every broadcaster from TG Card to, to RTE to TV3, uh, and then off to the UK. And every horse racing venue across Ireland as well is all connected by NEP Connect fibre, which means uh, every race now uh, can go everywhere to every broadcaster and every race and every stadium in the UK can also go from fibre straight into Ireland into every broadcaster as well. So we look after management of all that. Where it used to be satellite dishes, so in NEP Ireland we have about nine satellite trucks that you see going around with the big dishes. Uh, they're kind of coming off now and it's moving on to fibre opt fibre optic cable uh, all over the country. A lot of stuff that you wouldn't see. Um, now, let's talk about uh, Fingal and why we're here. So uh, Riot Games, which is the second largest esports company in the world, uh, the first one being Blizzard, which Microsoft mm -hmm. bought for 70 billion about a month ago, two months ago. So this is the second biggest. They had an office uh, down in the Keys where they look after uh, finances and bits and like that, uh, investment like that. But what they've done is they set up the largest broadcast center in Europe, and it's the highest quality, most technical broadcast center in the world, and they've set it up in Swords. Uh, they started the build in October. It completed about a month ago, and we went live at the weekend. So it is, if you imagine in RTE, there's four control rooms. Uh, in Swords, there's six control rooms that are about three times the size of anything RTE has. So it is huge, and it has the best tech you can get in the globe. Uh, and it's all runs out of there. So basically, it's the backbone to about 50 studios across the globe. They all feed their cameras back into Swords. Uh, in Swords, in these control rooms, we have directors, uh, vision mixers, producers, engineers, sound team, cameras. The commentators are all uh, Irish-based, and they all uh, commentate from all multiple different rooms around there. And we'll feed out to... Uh, approximately uh, will, will be six different languages at any stage for any event that goes on. So if you don't know about eSports and how big it is, it's basically watching different teams playing each other on computer games. It sounds ridiculous. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. But it is, uh, it, it would, like one match will have uh, more viewership than uh, at the Super Bowl, let's just say, in the States, which obviously is one of the biggest broadcasters, or biggest broadcasts in the States. Yeah. A, a game of esports will have a bigger kind of viewership than that. So that's the scale that it's at, that let's just say certain generation won't be aware of. 
uh, what goes on in that world. And, that, and so that's what they've built into there. Now, what we're doing at Riot Games is we're providing all uh, the crew. So we provide all the personnel from coordinators, um, managers, all the way through to your engineers and your directors. Um, so what we're having a problem with is it's a, it's a, a disturbance in the industry because where the industry was tight anyway for crew, suddenly they need 100 people a day and uh, we don't have that. So what's happening now is you're kind of getting people out of RTE or getting people out of TV3 and it's leaving gaps that you can't fill. Even ourselves, we've had to move people from NEP Ireland over to the right facility and you're trying to backfill into these positions, but the people aren't there. So it, it's a case of we start, I see here what we don't, we've done at last year, we started a two year uh, apprenticeship program ourselves because I wasn't aware of the apprenticeship program. So uh, we took eight <laughs> people in, we did 50 uh, 50 female, male, just to kind of, because that's what we're trying to do in NEP on a global, is going to give it a gender balance across the globe. Um, but uh, so that's, that will come to an end for the first one next year, but we've taken a lot of learnings from it. And actually, I think the discussions will get deeper into how to do it. Uh, kind of, yeah, 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 we'll have that uh, chat after this. <laughs> th we found mistakes the way we did it, but it's, uh, it's been interesting. And I think we need to grow it because where we did eight and we went, oh, that was great. We have eight people. Now we look at it and we go, actually, we need an awful lot more than that because with Riot coming on board with what their demands are, and every time I go into Riot Building and Swords, they ask for another person. And, it, and of course, I agree and then walk out in a kind of sweat. <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of what NEP is doing here at the moment in a global point of view. It, it is a problem anyway, which doesn't affect Fingal. But uh, on my calls, it's the same problem we're having here in every genre, in every business. It's the same problem NEP is having on a global scale. So when I get on those calls twice a week uh, with all the different European companies, they're all having the same problem problem is that there's nobody coming into the industry. Uh, so it is a, a, a good in, uh, conversation to have with colleges about how to focus um, uh, kind of the learnings and, the, and what courses there are, how long those courses need to be, how we can partner up to get these people into the industry quicker, uh, because that's the problem we're having with our side. The other problem that's happening in the industry is because I deal with every different production company every day is, is the actual TV side of productions. So from your researchers, producers, production managers, production coordinators, there, there is nobody coming through and there is a, a panic at the moment. There's a lot of LinkedIn posts kind of asking for people. Now what's happening is um, because Bigger Stage is a new company that started in the last year, they're making uh, Fox shows. So Fox are flying uh, all the participants and all the contestants into and the presenters into Dublin when we make their shows now here. So there's big Fox shows being made in Dublin uh, and Wicklow. Uh, the, last month we did, the first one went to air, which is the first Irish or US network show ever made uh, in Ireland. That went to air, it's a uh, name that tune. Uh, Beaches Am with Jamie Fox starts shooting next month. Uh, the, uh, name that tune is coming back for 20 episodes in July because uh, it went so well. What's that? Uh, so it's just, there's so many jobs in this country now in this industry, but it, it was kind of ignored for the last while because what everybody was looking at was high-end drama and features, but nobody looked at broadcast, but actually broadcast behind the scenes was exploding and now it's trying to play catch up. You know, and that's why we need the, those apprenticeship schemes to kind I of suppose, kick and in faster. I mean, there's two genres there really. I mean, there's the, as you said, the production. Yeah back-end piece and all the yeah, tech yeah. support that's needed. And then, as you said, the researchers, high, you know, producers of the programmes and all of that, kind yeah. of the more traditional TV roles. To my mind, and this will show me age now, the only college that ever did anything in this was Ballyfermot. You know, they did animation and uh, TV tech, kind of very, uh, did a really, really well, niche, captive um, student body that went to it. Obviously, that isn't enough to cope with the demand. And like I know of several production companies that are operating in in Ireland, Irish grown companies, not to the scale of NEP and Riot Games in particular. I'm kind of a little bit scared by that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that, that has a bigger audience. Yeah. But what can your industry do to try and bridge that gap? I mean, you, you talk about you took on apprentices yourselves and you de designed your own apprenticeship program. Meet Mary Liz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talk okay, to Mary okay. Liz, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, are, is your industry or as your own company, are you having those conversations with the third level institutes or do you think that they've there's just, a gap? It's just started. Um, so I went out to AIDT 
uh, and uh, kind of started it because they've started this year, they started a full broadcast course, which is the first time they've ever done it, where it used to be directors and cameras. Now it's actually broadcast, so it's vision mixers and it's, and it's lighting, it's everything to do with broadcast. And they started that this year, but it's a three year course. So nice. that's another two years I have to wait for those people to come through yeah. before we can even get them on board to and push through. But yes, the colleges, we've sent out mails this week about uh, starting the discussion about trying to get the colleges on board, what the needs and wants from the colleges and what the needs and wants are from us as well to, to kind of partner up in that and see what way we can bring it through. Because there is the, the other issue is that the high-end drama and features are still there yes. and they're going to expand. So there's a company called MTG, another American company has bought Ardmore and Troy Studios. Uh, they're expanding their studios. So they're build, the first one just finished last week where we're filming next week. Uh, and then there's the Greystones Media Campus, which is yeah. 15 stu uh, studios, stages, uh, and they want to do high-end TV as well. So that's all happening but there's not enough people in there. Even with Troy Studios, uh, Apple were doing foundation there and they moved it to Eastern Europe, but they took the 115 Irish people with them, which yeah. means that's 115 people less working here. Talent's been exported. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's like the media has kind of, it isn't high on the focus, but actually maybe it should be because we do have an opportunity here to make Ireland an entertainment hub if American broadcasters start to use Ireland because we're also editing all those shows here as well. So we're doing the full package for all these American broadcasters. If we can make Ireland a hub and a go-to place for entertainment, it, like the industry could like double or triple. Well, another piece of work that we would be involved with in Fingal is Ireland as gateway to Europe being the only now English-speaking country yep. in Europe. And it's all about that transatlantic two-way conversation and you know you, you've articulated it really well you know that we are the launch pad for all of these businesses and if the US want to start producing and filming in Ireland great and but you need the skills and you need the, the staff and employees to fill that gap are you generating and I, I get a sense from me that there's a, a good bit of cannibalization in your own industry in the sector and just you know you people are with you, with RTE one week, they're with you the next week, they could be with Apple the week after. How do you stop that? I mean, what, can you, what can you do to incentivize your staff to remain with you? And is, is there opportunity through the I, skills I, for it to do that? Uh, is there, there's a little bit of that. Uh, I suppose the problem which a lot of uh, companies are facing at the moment is everybody comes and goes, I'm going to leave unless I get paid more, uh, uh, which is a problem and it's, it's seemingly daily at this stage. So yes. with the costs are going up, but inflation is going up, everything else is getting yes. more expensive, but you've had to, to retain these people, you have to pay them more. It, it, it can't continue on and that's why new people need to come in and, and new people need to come in quickly. Uh, the cannibalization thing is a problem. Uh, even with RTE, people are like, I, I'm taking people from RTE, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and mm -hmm. that goes against everything that we want to do because I did 10 years in RTE. So like, I know what it's like, how hard it can be in RTE, but that I know they need a, an awful lot of staff as well. And the last thing I want to do is take people out, but I, but I have to. Yeah. Yeah. So to speak to your own, uh, your own uh, I suppose, journey to where you are now, you, you mentioned there you worked in RT for 10 years. So tell me, how did you get to where you are? Like wh when you were in school, what did you want to do? <laughs> is this what you wanted to do? Is this what you thought you'd be doing? Yeah, my story is a bit odd. I came, my parents had... Uh, post-production facility and studio facilities. So okay. I grew up in the industry. Uh, then uh, I wasn't brilliant in school, uh, like Minister Harris was talking about. If, if I went off what my leaving cert was, I, I don't know what I'd be doing now. But um, I wasn't great in school. I went to Ballyfermot, um, but I, I went there for doing the broadcast course, but mm -hmm. I only lasted about six months because I'd grown up in the industry. I was I felt like I, I knew more than what I was being taught. So I'm slightly <laughs> different. Yeah. So uh, then I went to RTE, I uh, did 10 years there. I was producing shows, presenting some kids shows. And then I worked in the UK, then I worked in features, did Saving Private Ryan, Michael Collins, those kind of features, mm -hmm. uh, just as assistant director. And then uh, went into another Fingal company, um, or based in Fingal, uh, Vision Independent Productions over in Finglas, um, where we do, like we did Operation Transformation, Supergarden, all those type of different shows for RTE. So I did that for 11 years, uh, going through the ranks uh, within VIP. Wow. And, and are you now primarily involved with the esports, with the Riot Games side of things, or are you your NEP? Uh, I, I do everything. You're everything, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, now I've been build, building teams yes. uh, out of the problem, as you were just saying, is you're taking other people. So because there's, a, there's a, uh, an issue with production managers in this country, there is none, or very few, uh, I've just taken two mm -hmm. on a full-time basis 
to look after riot. Okay. Uh, so it is it is a problem. But now my, my job then is basically is uh, quoting, dealing with the clients, looking like that. So, but my clients are everywhere. So it's not just Irish. Like this week, we had two trucks, uh, one in Man City and one in Liverpool, doing Champions League uh, nice. games. This you know for French TV. So like I, I yeah, it's very varied. Yeah, what I yeah. do. Yeah. And NEP are such a big player in this space, like globally. So what can NEP do, you know, to have that conversation or to start the conversation with the education sector here in Ireland? Because I know from a past life when a big pharmaceutical company were locating in Ireland for the first time, I went out of my way to sit down and talk with them to see what do they need in terms of training needs yeah. and spoke to the local IT. They designed a programme. Like, I know you've said there's, there's courses coming, but NEP surely have a, you have leverage, you know, you're bringing, potentially creating a lot of jobs in the country and, and in Europe globally. So that gives you, I suppose, a position, a starting point to have the conversation with the education sector and many of whom are in the room here today. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, how do you leverage that position? You know, what, what's your ask of the education sector? I suppose what we'll need to do is, is kind of uh, identify what we need first, right? Uh, and then it'll be a case of going out and meeting the colleges uh, face on and kind of going, this is this is what is needed. Because there's no way for the colleges to know exactly what's needed in an industry that most people don't really know because it kind of goes under the radar a little bit. Um, so it is that one-on-one -on -one thing. So I suspect over the next six months, it'll be a lot of face-to-face -face talks, a lot of meetings and discussions about uh, what way we can focus it, what way we can kind of get that education on board to what is, is, is the need of the industry. Because I think, I mean, you spoke about this kind of not hidden generation, but, you know, this esports didn't know it existed, to be very honest with you. Um, but, you know, there's a whole population there that may like to work in that industry. And, you know, they're obviously playing the games, yeah, yeah, watching the yeah. games, participating in them. So you have a niche audience that you can potentially convert into your own talent. Yeah, yeah. And get uh, to but uh, to get them, like even if they come to colleges doing other things, it'll mm -hmm. be interesting to know because they a lot of them play the games that Riot do. Yeah. Um, uh, to get them in on that apprenticeship scheme, but yeah. that's why I think where we did design an apprenticeship scheme, I think now we can design one properly and, and follow <laughs> through with it and, and bring. But what I need to do, I think, from today's discussions, is go out and talk to the different production companies, talk to our competitors about building a program that we can uh, apply for and then uh, and then try and get that together. And in terms then, I suppose, of I suppose the current cohort that might be working in the esports side of things, I mean, do they have longevity in, in the broader broadcasting family or is, are, is, it, is it very niche? You know, so if somebody, like I, I've done a broadcasting course or whatever it might be yeah. and I'm coming to you, you've taken me on, but kind of, I really want to work on Downton Abbey or whatever it is yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. future, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, is there that the, kind of the skill, throughput or okay, so the skill, set, are they the skill set is very transferable, mm -hmm. right? So the guys, some of the guys that we have in, in, in Swords uh, have come off uh, four years of working on the trucks all over the globe. Right. So it's the same, it's just, it's just a learning because the kit that they have in Riot is very advanced. So it's just a small training course just to get them up to speed. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. I could talk to yeah. you all day, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I have to say you're a great advocate for your industry. Um, you've, you've really articulated well the issues and the gaps, I suppose, that are there. Um, I just would like you all to thank Steve for his time. Sure. Thank, and you. thank you so much. Okay, folks, um, we are moving on to our next panel discussion. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome Professor Dara Kyo, President of DCU, uh, David Gannon, the Managing Director of the Malone Group, um, Joanne Rourke, Resource Efficiency Officer from Dublin City Council, and Eamon Donlan, CEO of the so Socratics and Chair of Balbriggan's Sustainable Energy Committee to the stage. Thank you. So I suppose this panel is, we're going to talk about our future skills needs. And I suppose a common theme across the sector, and it's been referenced several times already this morning, is about climate change and sustainability. And UN's sustainable goals are a call to action that every country has to protect the planet while building economic growth. It's a challenge and addressing our social needs. You know, obviously education, our health and jobs are very important. If Ireland is to meet its global and EU targets in respect of climate change, we need to shift our thinking. And I think we've started that shift and we have a long way to go um, in how we behave and how we work. 
it's already underway. I know we mentioned earlier on the Fingal, uh, sustainable Fingal strategy, helping businesses to do that transition to a kind of a lower carbon uh, type business model. But when we look to the horizon and think about sustainable development of business over the next five to 10 years, what does that look like from a skills point of view and an education point of view? And where are we going to find the people? to do those retrofits and the like. So that's kind of the theme for this morning's discussion. Um, I'm going to start with you, Joanne, if you don't mind. Um, and it's great to see you again after many years. Um, we talk about circular economy an awful lot. We I don't do. think people really know what it is. Can you explain it <laughs> in a layman's terms? I can. Um, I, I think there's actually a growing understanding and awareness around circular economy because I, I found that two years ago if I was speaking at something nobody really knew and now there, there a lot a lot more people do. So basically the circular economy is a system or a group of strategies that helps us keep materials and resources um, in play for, for, for longer. Um, so it's it's really designing out waste. It's looking at how we use materials and land and, and resources like energy and water um, from, you know, from items and, ser and services are designed, how they're used and, and how we dispose of them. So it's, um, or, or, or don't dispose of them. So it's an alternative really to the, um, the current system where we largely take uh, virgin resources from the earth, we make stuff out of it, we use them probably less thoughtfully than we should, and um, then at the end we we dispose of them, which means we lose a lot of a lot of resources. So the concept isn't it isn't really new at all. Um, it's probably what our grannies did in the thirties and forties. Really, it's about reusing things. It's about repairing things. It's about keeping things um, for as long as possible to you know get the most value out of them. Um, the original term was coined in the 1970s, in fact, by a man called Walter Stahl, who was an economist. But more recently, it's be, been um, promoted, I suppose, and, and you know, awareness has been spread by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So they would do a lot of research around this, and and um, they've some wonderful reports. I would really advise anyone who wants to find out about the circular economy to go on to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation site. Um, they have reports on different sectors, <clears throat> excuse me, on circular cities and, and things like that. Um, so in terms of how we do that, how we get to a circular economy, uh, there's obviously lots of parts to that, but skills are going to be really, really important because in some ways there are kind of old skills we've kind of forgotten or we, you know, we've fall out, fallen out of the habit of using like repair skills and, you know, sewing a button on something, um, but also, you know, actually being able to repair something. For instance, I play in a, the Blanche's Tambrass Band and um, I play a cornet and I have this bag for my cornet and recently the zip broke so I had to get a new bag because there's no one who can put a new zip on it which is just ridiculous and annoying so we, we need to find people who can actually and train people who can actually do that because it's killing me that I have to bring it to the, the recycling centre, you know, instead of just getting it repaired. Um, so skills are like that, like the old skills, I suppose, that we've, we've forgotten or we don't use anymore. But also... Um, a lot of new technological skills because a lot of like smart cities and things like that will, will help us actually implement a circular economy. And also skills around things like innovation, problem solving, design, um, and, and so on. And where do you think... Well, the role of the local authorities, I suppose, we've been charged with a climate action agenda and we all have climate action plans and we're, you know, rolling out... But for the most part, they're very inward looking. They're looking at what the local authority can do itself to reduce its own impact, not the, the broader community's impact. So where do you see the local authority's role in, in you know, being at the forefront of that? Well, I actually think there are a lot of things happening. I mean, the, the fact that we're talking about this now at an event, that's that's one thing. And um, the fact that you're looking into, um, or you're starting a, a, a green skills group, that's something else. And I think as you look across local authorities across the country, you do find that there's stuff, There's qu there is quite a lot going on, but it's 
patchy in that everybody isn't doing the same thing. I think that's going to change, though. I think we're on the cusp of that changing because, for one thing, there's been an explosion of policy at national level around circular economy. So in 2020, the um, Action Plan for Circular Economy was, um, was published. And then this year, we've had the whole of government strategy for the circular economy. And then the Circular Economy Bill, of course, was, was passed um, there a couple of weeks ago. So I think once, once the um, legislative measures in the bill start coming through, I think that will trickle down to, to the, um, the local authorities. And of course, that will also be the, the backbone or the policy is, is the backbone of our new waste management plan, which is going to be a national waste management plan, which I'm very excited about. I know it probably doesn't excite everybody else in the room. <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> Um, and the three themes for that are consumption, which I'm delighted we're actually talking about, because I think for a long time we, we weren't really talking about consumption. We, we consume too much. We just we buy too much stuff, we use too much stuff, we throw away too much stuff. And I'm really delighted that that's one of the, the themes in there, you know, because it means that it might start that discussion. Um, another thing, like for instance, in Dublin City Council, we... My office works along with the Economic Development Office to run a, a circular economy training program for SMEs. It's called MODIS, which doesn't stand for anything. Everyone always asks me that. It was just kind of a name we came up with. Um, but we've run that course now sometimes nationally, sometimes more regionally, and there's about 100 businesses have been through it already. It's, it's only been on the go a couple of years. Um, now that I know there's 85,000 businesses, though, in Dublin, I'm kind of scared. <laughs> <laughs> we obviously need to scale that up pretty quickly. Um, but also, there, there's other really nice things happening. For instance, and this is, is quite exciting, um, Dunleary, uh, Rathdown County Council, they are considering signing a Circular Cities Declaration. And now that's the, the elected representative yes. of the yeah. council, the, the mayor and so on. Um, and that hopefully, hopefully will actually happen in the next couple of weeks and at their, their, next, um, their next council meeting. Not to preempt, it'll probably happen. I'm not saying definitely will. Um, but I know that they have discussed that at their SPC and um, it would be brilliant to get all councils to yeah. do that because I think once you have the, the kind of political backing to do it, it makes officials like like me and you, mm -hmm. Emer, it makes our jobs easier to, yeah. to, to do it. So if there's any councillors from Fingal County Council remaining in the office. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think you're, you're preaching <coughs> to the converted here, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you were to pick one exampler um, internationally, you know, that Ireland should be looking to in terms of just, you know, uh, sustainable business, circular economy, where, you know, if people are looking to go, well, you know, oh, I really want to do something with my business, but I'd like to see it in action somewhere else. Where, where would you point them to? Um, well, Circular Flanders are doing amazing work. I mean, there's a few, like Circular Flanders, Circular Glasgow. There's also uh, Amsterdam actually based their new development plan on, the, on donut economics, which mm -hmm. is sort of a, a complementary um, concept to the circular economy. So I suppose it, it introduces the, the social aspect to the circular economy. Um, donut economics is a concept whereby you have the, the floor, I suppose, of, of what a, a sort of decent lifestyle is. So you have enough food, you have enough um, education, health, etc. And then the ceiling is the, the planetary boundaries. So it's that Goldilocks mm. uh, zone, I suppose, within which we can have, you know, a nice, um, reasonable lifestyle without wrecking the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so Amsterdam, actually, when they were doing their new development plan, they based it on that concept. So I think that's a really good example. Circular Flanders are doing it a lot, an awful lot um, in terms of um, helping businesses transition to the circular economy. And just to give you an idea, the average circularity, because you can measure circularity, and um, the, the average circularity for, for Europe is around 11%. Globally, it's 8.6%. In Ireland, it's a dismal 1.6%. We're, wow. we're very behind. Um, in Flanders, it's 21%. Now, just to put the that 21% in context, 
um, there, there is a, a very big link, be by the way, between climate change or climate action and the circular economy mm -hmm. because a lot of the carbon emissions uh, we actually produce are tied up with the way we use materials and land and, and so on. Um, so if we can actually tackle how we use materials and how we use land, we'll go a long way towards um, tackling our climate emissions. So, um, almost lost my train of thought. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, 21% is phenomenal. So, yeah, it is because, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. In order for us to actually achieve um, or, or to keep our, to keep the temperature from rising above 1.5 degrees, mm -hmm. which is sort of global goal at the moment, we have to be about 17% circular. Flanders are 21% and they're not, they're not resting on that. They're trying to get better. And they're, they're doing lots of things like um, they provide funding for businesses to transition to the circular economy. They have um, a lot of training and information and um, online hubs, a little bit like the skills one, but for, for the circular economy. And these are all really important because if you ask businesses what are the barriers, they're always the same barriers. <clears throat> it's um, training, comes out top, you know, training and information, um, having the, the sort of, especially for SMEs, getting the resources, not just in money, but also in time and people to, to do it. And also, also funding and also ways of networking with other businesses because circular economy is very, very collaborative and collaboration is being mentioned loads today. It's very collaborative. Businesses have to collaborate with each other, which means that it's a very different mindset for businesses. They're used to being competitive. This is about collaborating um, with other businesses in your area, keeping things quite local, collaborating along supply chains, collaborating with policymakers and, and local authorities as well. So um, I've given you two examples there. No, of course. no, no, it's okay. I we'll forgive you for those. <laughs> They're very good. Um, David, um, you were at the Malone Group. And when we talk about sustainability, I mean, sustainability means something different to everybody. I know I've had a conversation with somebody when I was talking about sustainability from a business point of view, and they were talking about it purely from a green agenda point of view. What does it mean to you and your uh, company? Thanks for the hardest question of the day. <laughs> <Anywhere>? Sorry. <laughs> I'll remember that. Uh, well, just pre to go on, on, on a previous comment, we have a Ukrainian family living next door to us and the kids are shocked with what we consume. Locally, yeah. the four cars outside the house, the brand new clothes, the bicycles, the consumption, the food in the supermarket. So it's a real point of conversation with the neighbours the last few weeks about, wow. you know, an introspection point, you know. Uh, sustain sustainability for us in Malone Group is seeing practical examples, and I'll, I'll highlight a few actually, which, which is of interest. But from a personal point of view, we need to reduce the carbon footprint. That, that's a given, and the technology is there. It's the amount of time it's going to take to get there and rebuild our infrastructure is the key, and that needs people. For me personally, uh, and it follows on from the previous point, it's bigger than that. There's a limited amount of resources to make the microprocessors, to make the food, to produce the electric cars, and we disproportionately take too much resources in the West. Don't want to sound too existential about it, mm -hmm. but we need to look and rebuild our economy to be more sustainable and share the wealth and the resources we have with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I think for us, we need to attract people into the country. We mm -hmm. need to skill people and visitors into the country. We need to grow capacity. Everybody's industry is suffering. So Steve's example, I thought it was just an engineering and projects that we were struggling. I just need people. Yeah. Natasha can then help me grow those people into the next generation of engineers. So one of the thoughts I had today was, you know, let's, let's bring talent into Ireland like we did years ago in the States. Educate those people, give them 10 years of an experience in pharma, a medical device and then let them go out and bring that talent back to their country so I think that's maybe something we need to look at too. Yeah no a really really interesting point I remember years ago I think Aer Lingus ran a program where they trained avionic engineers from Brunei mm. they came mm. on a two-year kind of mm. placement and then they took their skills back to mm. Brunei to train mm. um, the colleagues mm. um, in that country mm. because they couldn't afford to run the training for themselves so that's mm. a really really interesting mm. point but I think we probably need to train a few people and keep them as well for a while. Yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> the, the other point, talking to Pat from, uh, uh, from Dundalk as well, you know, I'm a fraud too, by the way, Steve. Uh, I did a degree in politics and ended up running an uh, engineering company. <laughs> Don't ask me. And I did my last qualification last year, a bit like Siobhan. I've meandered 
through my career and had lots of interest and opportunities. And I think that's the point Pat said it. You know, we've 55 years of work or 60 years of work, if you look at my kids. So they might start off in engineering or they might start off in the arts and they'll evolve their career and we need to enable that. Mm -hmm. So the three best engineers we have at the moment, one guy started off as a welder, two of them were electricians and one of them, our safety manager was also an electrician. We have a Russian speaker, a person with a Russian degree who's our marketing person. We've our bid manager has a qualification in law. So they're not engineers. So it, we, we, we always think we're an oddball company because we take people from different backgrounds and not from traditional areas, but we help them grow into the roles that we need. And th if they go off in 10 years' time or five years' time, that's fine too. You've got your value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think it's, really, it's a really interesting point. Well made. I don't think anybody in this room is in the career that they thought they'd be yeah. in when they were 16 or 17 <laughs> or even at 20 or 25. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean yeah. And, and apologies yeah. for anybody that's under 25. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't think any of us are, in, mm. are, are where we thought mm. we'd be. And that's not a bad thing, no. you know, because no. you bring all that learning with yeah. you on, on yeah. each stage of your journey. Dara, you're listening with great interest, I think, <laughs> to all that's Absolutely. going on. The key skills um, that yeah, you're, you're seeing emerging from this yeah, morning's the, the conversation. The key skills is interesting because I think that the, uh, I think first of all, just congratulate Fingal and everybody for, for today that, as the minister said in his introduction, that Fingal is ahead of the, the posse. We work very closely with Fingal. Ironically, we're in Dublin City. Uh, uh, ironically, we're in Dublin <laughs> City, but our, our probably we do more with Fingal. Uh, if we were founded now, we'd probably be called Fingal University. But uh, I think the abbreviation of that FU, I don't think would, uh, <laughs> FU wouldn't wouldn't go down very well. But uh, what strikes me, I suppose, all the time is just how close we work together. And, and Ema is saying, well, what should we do as a, as a local authority? But the, the the really strong point that emerges from the discussion today is that it's not what any of us can do, but that we are better together and that we will only be able to deliver when we work together. And if we're talking about sustainability and we're talking about futures and all of these things, I, I'm absolutely convinced. I mean, we work with Fingal on the Dublin Belfast Economic Corridor. We have the Dublin Belfast FinTech Corridor, uh, all of these projects that we work on together. And I think if we worked together, we, we could create uh, an environment here, an economy and a society to rival Denmark or the, the Netherlands in terms of sustainability. If you're talking about Flanders, for instance, the, the public services there, um, I mean, to Steve's point, the housing crisis is, is a, a, at an extraordinary situation for us. And none of these things, as the minister said, can be dealt with uh, individually, and we need to do those together. So in terms of sustainability, in terms of the future, uh, the most sustainable resource in any society is the people themselves. It's ultimately renewable uh, and should be renewable. And Dave spoke about a, a career of 40 years, but the reality for us is that most of our people have retirement for 35 years or almost 40 years as well. So we're not just preparing people to function in the workplace, but to flourish, to flourish through life. Um, Dublin City University is a public university dedicated to the public good. And we have a massive responsibility. And when I'm sitting here this morning, thrilled to be here and listening to all my partners, but you're thinking in your head, oh, Jesus, there's so much more for, so much more for us to do. But uh, our promise is that we will continue to, to work with you. We were talking earlier, Siobhan was asking about measurables. What are the measurables? This week, the Times Higher published the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we commit ourselves to transforming lives and societies. That's what we do. Uh, at DCU. That's our mission. So how did we figure this week in the Sustainable Development Goals? Well, in terms of reducing poverty, we were number one in Ireland. In terms of gender equality, we were number one in Ireland. And in terms of reducing inequality, we were number one in Ireland. So across three of the Sustainable Development Goals, we are delivering for Fingal, for Dublin and for Ireland. In terms of the QS rankings, we are number one in Ireland for graduate employment. So that's graduates who actually go straight into employment. So number one, number one in Ireland there. And the CSO published last week stats that showed the earnings of graduates from all of Ireland's institutions. And on those metrics too, we were um, number one uh, in terms of uh, income at the end of year one and number one of all the institutions at the end of year 10. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, access to excellence is, is our mission. 
um, a commitment to sustainability, commitment to opportunity. And you can do all of those things. As I say, you can reduce poverty, you can improve gender balance, you can reduce inequality, and you can still produce people at the end who will flourish throughout their career. And I think that Steve hit it, uh, the nail on the head, that what we find all the time is that people come in and they say, we need, we need, we need. And then you say, ultimately, well, what do you need? Like, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Uh, <laughs> and uh, at the end of the day, they can't put their finger on it because what you need this year isn't what you're going to need next year or what you're going to need the year after. So what people really need, I think, is smart, smart graduates. Uh, and education is really about attitude. It's about your own disposition. Will you be able to reinvent yourself? Do you have that bounce to bounce into the world as yet kind of unimagined? And that flexibility that we've spoken about this morning is absolutely critical. And it will be a mistake for us, uh, and this is a health warning, it'll be a mistake for us if we move to a homogenous education system. That what we need uh, is d diversification. If all of us become the same, uh, it'll be a sad case for Ireland. So what we are doing consciously at DCU is kind of le leading out with the, with the ETBs and increasing the number of FE to HE pathways on all, on all of our programs. Uh, and our policy is, is in advance of the ministers on that one. The RPL piece, the recognition of prior learning, absolutely critical that people's experience either in a formal or an informal setting can be recognised and they can join this kind of pathway at whatever they find themselves. Uh, and, and I think that, that that is really the key for us. So how do we work best with the City of Dublin ETB or Dunleary or whoever? Why isn't there an FE pathway in Fingal, for instance? Uh, th those are critical things, but we must work together in a differentiated system. The, the, the temptation say, listen to Steve, is we need to do that, we need to do that, we need to do that. But for us, what we're trying to do, our, our philosophy is about, it's about people. Is this good for our people, our place and our planet? Is it focus? Is this what DCU should be doing? Or should Trinity be doing it? Or TUD? Or somebody else? Uh, or, and the final one is the impact. What, what will happen if we do this? How will we make things, how will we make things to better? But the partnership spirit in the room is absolutely critical. And that's my promise to you in DCU, that we will work in the sustainability piece. And, and the, the guarantee is that there'll be no reduction uh, in the, the economic value of that as well. So no, thanks. I mean, and from, I suppose, my point of view, my, my former point of view, <laughs> in my former role, is, is that it's the two go hand in hand. You know, it's yeah. economic sustainability and environmental sustainability. There is business opportunities there. There are business opportunities there. And I suppose it's just about reducing our overall impact while feeding into the local economy and driving and having a thriving local economy with local employment. And that's really what I suppose Fingal are trying to achieve. Eamon, you're very passionate about climate action and digital technologies. Great opportunity for synergy between the two. Are there skills gaps there or where, where is your future skill requirement in what you do? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a collective of, of what's been said totality throughout the day, right? I mean, you know, everything has to be about collaboration. So the number one skill that we need is people to be agile in their mindset, people to be willing to, you know, cross boundaries, you know, cross departments, cross, you know, industries, right? And and be collaborative. Uh, so we need to, to kind of be teaching that mindset from education, from apprenticeship to everywhere. Uh, if you look at the big picture, right, in essence, nature has laid the blueprint for us, right? It's a regenerative system that reduces waste and eliminates waste almost automatically in most of, of the natural models. So we just need to replicate that in our business worlds, in our academic you know, worlds, and understand how that model works and apply that. Now, you know, do we need practical things right now? Yes, we need to have people trained up to do retrofits. We need to have people trained up to upgrade the grid so we can potentially export energy to Europe and you know, build out you know, kind of Ireland as a destination for some of these, these verticals. But the beauty of, of this country is that it's got this county structure that you can incubate things in Fingal County and test things and be really progressive in one, get it right, and then export it around the country and then potentially over to Europe. And being the only English speaking, there's a lot of opportunity for startups mm -hmm. in this space mm -hmm. to use technology to do this. We need to be doing, you know, training people for regenerative farming practices and getting that into agriculture. Uh, you know, obviously the circular economy provides a lot of opportunities, but a company doesn't have to switch to circular economy immediately, but they should start thinking about stop trying to take what you've done and make it better 
which is what ESG has been all about. And really, it's how can we, can we have a division try one product where we start from scratch and design it without waste, right? How do we have that? And sometimes startups can come out of that, yeah. right? Sometimes yeah. technology can drive that. But, you know, in essence, what's it, what it is is a regenerative mindset. You know, if we're going to have collectives working, uh, you were bringing me flashbacks there because I spent 15 years in media and I started out as a producer and then I ran into operations and then I did business and now I'm doing startups. You know, in, in essence, you know, how do we have that regenerative model and thinking across, you know, each department and each industry? Um, and how do we have these different industries work together? Um, you know, it, it's a challenge. It, it's never going to be easy with understanding what, what kind of business model you can develop. Is it a single business line? You know, is it looking at um, co-ops to, to leverage resources through a lot of different environments? Co-ops have been around for 200 years. You can still focus on profit. You're not saying everything needs to be a nonprofit, but you can leverage resources in a way that maybe you wouldn't in other mm -hmm. ways. Should startups be that or a social enterprise, but then also you know, collaborate with big industry that can't afford to change their model from dri you know, driving for big profits. So maybe they can work in a co-op to, to you know, Im improve efficiencies and, and be more sustainable together as a collective. I think the best, well, the best model I've seen of that kind of all in operation is in Munich. Um, around the university in Munich and the clusters of business, co-ops, big business, education, all working together. Very low carbon impact, you know, very low, but that collective collaborative regenerative process ongoing the whole time. I think we're getting there. <laughs> I think we've a bit to go. Um, I think we're willing participants at this table here uh, for sure. Um, when we look at, like I suppose, digitization and we talk, we've smart file Brigham, Smart DCU, you know, what are the opportunities there? I mean, do you see that as a new growing space and something that's going to constantly evolve, Eamon and David? And, do you, you know, how, how do you see that space growing? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that um, the opportunities for cities to engage with industry is key in, in this piece. Uh, active travel is a huge opportunity. But how can we think outside the box? How can we use force relationships, a critical thinking theory, where you take climate change and creative arts and put them together and come up with new ideas, right? Can we use events for creative arts as a way to shut down the streets every Sunday? Mm -hmm. And you know we did it for the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Balbriggan and many other cities, right? Okay, well, there was no traffic during that time. Okay, let's test that with creative arts. Oh, we're doing this for an event. Oh, let's do that Sundays. Well, why don't we do that all weekend? Malahide's done this, right? Mm -hmm. you know, why okay, now let's do it for the whole weekend. So we need to reduce our consumption. We need to reduce our reliance on vehicles and cars. You know, these are hard things to do. You can't just tell people to get rid of cars, especially people in the country that just have no option. So let's test some of these things in ways that make sense, that are tangible, that people in the community can actually get behind. Oh, I'll cycle down to that. I'll walk down to that. Or I'll drive to a certain point. And and walk the rest of the way. You're changing mindsets. It's mm -hmm. about changing the culture and the smart cities, the way they get designed and the way the you know the bodies work with public you know officials and, and academics and industry all working together. You know that that's what's needed. And so the smart city concepts to me sometimes are too many pilots, not enough execution. But in the active travel space, I see a lot of opportunities. So I would I would say that would be one area where there can be you know movement that helps set the culture for a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, the you'd always hear, oh God, don't close the street, we'll lose business. We had footfall up like 90% in Malahide, you know, in business areas and businesses able to employ additional staff to cope with the influx of visitors because it's pedestrianised, you know, and that has multiple benefits, economic benefits, environmental benefits, changing the mindset of how people transit through their t our towns and villages, you know, as you said, park the car before they're out, walk and stride, park and stride, easy done. Sarah, DCU Alpha and Smart DCU. Tell yeah, me a bit about I that. Mean, again, DCU Alpha, there's a lot of chat about creating kind of uh, ecosystems in the docklands between other other university. Uh, for us, DCU Alpha has been a, a great success that we were able to acquire the Enterprise Ireland site in, in Glasnevin. We are able to uh, to lease it. We, we run it as part of the university. It's kind of high-tech crossover between kind of research of the university uh, and industry. There are over six, 60 companies based there working out on the smart technology. You'll have seen the, the tier uh, scooters, for instance, the bicycles, uh, kind of exploring kind of gre green tech. Uh, and again, we're moving DCU Invent from the campus down to DCU Alpha campus. Uh, our undergraduate programs, again, have been kind of entirely rebooted. Uh, engineering and sustainability, a bachelor's in kind of climate change, uh, psychology, mathematics, those type of crossovers all designed with industry partners. And uh, again, and we have the what we used to call the third sector there, people like localised kind of youth, youth volunteering. And I think just, just on that point, 
that uniquely DCU has a full faculty of education. So we uh, educate teacher educators from early years right through to adult education. And what we've seen across all of those programs, again, is a, is a rebooting with, with sustainability in mind, with kind of future skills, and career guidance teachers as well, who will be able to present the, the full menu to uh, young people kind of le leaving our schools. But an extra panel on the CAO website isn't going to change this uh, we need attitudinal change. So Minister Harris is here today talking about we need apprenticeships, we don't need kind of university graduates. Uh, if uh, the tallest that was here today speaking to uh, FDI people, he'd be saying we've the highest percentage of graduates uh, in Europe. So we need a kind of a consistency there between selling, selling Ireland and building sustainable societies. So that's precisely why we need, I think, uh, the, the FE sector, the apprenticeship, the HE, the whole, we all need to sing uh, in tandem. Mm. And I think uh, DCU Alpha is, is, a, is a good example of that in terms of industry, kind of employers and education research working together. Thanks, Sarah. David? Yeah, Emer, just in terms of uh, digitalization, if, if you'd asked me that question a year ago, I might, might not have been able to answer as, as, as practically. Uh, so, so fortunately, in the last year or two, it's the best use of technology. It's being innovative about all the technology on our phone, remote sensing. The technology is there. So Smurfit approached us last year. We retrospectively fitted monitors on their production line of cardboard boxes. Not very uh, sexy projects, by the way. People, <laughs> people are falling asleep. Um, but then we used an algorithm. We used AI to predict maintenance and predict production issues. So what that meant is they saved money. They reduced the amount of production staff and maintenance staff, and they reduced the materials they needed to maintain the machinery. Mm -hmm. And that stuff, pe nobody lost their job. Automation is not about losing jobs. Those people were promoted into project management and into administrative roles and different roles within Smurfit. Uh, the idea you have a digital factory of the future down in Limerick that we're working on at the moment. It's robotics, it's automated guided vehicles, it's all very interesting. But the technology is really in the software and the data behind that. Mm -hmm. They can create a digital twin of the factory in the cloud and you can manipulate that factory before you ever have to spend money or energy or effort on the ground. So that's efficient. Very low, low amount of input in terms of uh, uh, staff on the ground. The staff are sitting behind the scenes with the technology. That creates capacity to employ more people in the other areas in a pharmaceutical or medical device company. So that's digitization for me. We all used digital technology the last two years when we pivoted. Mm -hmm. So we had all these apps and technology in Malone Group and Teams and everything. And we'd invested about 500,000 euros in uh, all sorts of tech and I was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, by the end of March, I was delighted. So mm -hmm. it's the best use. The technology is there. We need to innovate as companies and as organizations. We need to share the learnings and the skills come, the micro credentials that Natasha talked about. Give me a good engineer, give me a good project manager and upskill them constantly on these new technologies and these new areas. Yeah, and I think that's it. I mean, it's all about, I think when you see how you can use technology to reduce your footprint. I, I was out with a logistics company that are out in the M50 belt and they had it down to the cent in terms of the movement of their um, trucks. Yeah. And if they located, they were looking, they need bigger premises and they were looking to locate on various sites. But if they moved three miles down the road, it was going to add to their cost. So they weren't doing it. And it was going to add to their emissions and all. They were very conscious of all of that. So I think technology, as you said, used properly and you yeah. can be used to our good for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we have any further comments from anybody just to wrap up or just about finish the session. Um, so, just, yeah, go on, Joanne. Sorry. I've um, one further comment. Um, really, when Eamon was talking about uh, climate action and you know the arts and putting uh, putting those two things together, um, I just want to say that a lot of what we have to do is behavioural change. It's getting people to change, and I actually think the arts are really, really important, and really valuable in that. You know, whether it's projects like the new Creative Climate or the yes. oh, what's it called Ireland, Creative Ireland, yes. the climate projects, or whether it's you know through um, musicians being activists or whether it's through, through drama or whatever, I think the arts are really crucial in changing those mindsets so that we can get behavioural change. I well, so I think um, to Dara's point about educators and all of that as well, I don't know, anybody, anybody that has young children, they are, they will persecute you until you change, because they believe everything their teacher tells them. So I have a climate ninja at home who yes, gives out to me every time I turn on a light or every time I get into my car. And you know, but they are, the per they are 
the real champions for change, you know, and if you're hitting the kids and then if you get the parents to meet them even halfway and then industry will come to, I know you want to get in, Eamon, but I think, I think the education sector is so crucial in our messaging and how we get out to those kids, be them under 10s, be them teenagers or whatever it might be. It starts to change the narrative and change the conversation and you will be pulled up by your children or your nieces or nephews or whoever it might be about what you're doing and how you're misbehaving with when it comes to sustainability and climate action. I leave the last word to you. Well, I mean, um, the creative arts are an extension of education, right? You know, and in essence, you know, I always like to say, you know, the creative arts really tell us about our past. They help us feel the current day. Um, and and they, they really project what the future is going to be, right? And so, in essence, you can try things in a make-believe world that you, you can't try in the real world. If you go back and watch films and anything else from 20, 30 years ago, you see a lot of things that have come to fruition today, right? And so that, that culture that we, you know, we need to cultivate is about reducing consumption. And, you know, and that's one of the things that we can use the, the arts to do. Yeah. Go on, Derek. Yeah, just to echo that point, uh, John Dewey, the American uh, education philosopher, famously said that education wasn't preparation for life, education is life itself. And I think that that's the message that we've got. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we'll finish on those fine words. Thank you very much, panel, and thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Um, just as we're just about to finish, um, Siobhan, I'm going to invite you back to the stage for some closing remarks, please. Um, on behalf of all of the stakeholders that have participated in this journey uh, from its inception and with the, the very, very important support of the, the local authority, we created something special, something to make Fingal a great place to live, work, visit, and do business. And for the fastest growing county in Europe uh, with the most, most diverse population, bringing all of us together, those of us who have needs and wants in terms of future employees, those of us who are working in education and training at any level, I would say be selfish. And by being selfish, you are contributing to the wider culture of, of our environment. And by that, I mean, if you are an education provider, you need learners, you need connections into employers. If you are an employer, you have a set of needs in terms of skills, in terms of whether it's apprentice, apprentices for a longer term drive, whether it's highly educated um, level eight and level nine graduates, whether it is micro credentials, you have to be selfish in order to enable us to be the best that we can be together. So my call is unapologetic to you. And that is, I want to hear from you. And in the event that you're networking with somebody else in a different business sector or a different education provision sector, please, we want to hear from you. We're looking for volunteers. We're looking for additional stakeholders to be part of the group. All we want to do is connect you with the skills you need or the learners and employer links that you need. So please make yourself available to either myself, Aoife, Emer, or Richard. We're all on LinkedIn. You can contact the guys on economic dev at fingal.ie, but you can contact me on LinkedIn and I'll give you direct contact details to who you want to contact. But we need more people involved in this project for it to be sustainable, for it to have longevity and for us to deliver the results that we can, not just for our own businesses, our own citizens, but our own kids and the kids of other people that are coming in to join this fantastic county. The other thing I'd say to you is the more successful this is, the more replicatable it will be for other counties that need it, that may, may not be as innovative as Fingal have been. So please, get involved. And if you really don't like somebody else, nominate them. I'll, I'll contact <laughs> them, no problem. You know? So for us, uh, we have a LinkedIn group. It's called Fingal Skills Strategy. Please like it and please share it. And any of your photographs or tweets from today, please also post them on LinkedIn. Please draw attention to this. The more people we can get this message out to, the more successful all of us will be in our own businesses, in our own endeavours. And that's what we're here for. If we can't contribute to each other through selfishness, through collaboration, what are we at? You know what I mean? This is our opportunity. Um, this is all of your opportunity. It's not just about what we can do for ourselves, it's about what we can do for each other. And look how successful we have all been doing that for each other. Fingal, in my opinion, is the best place to live, work, visit and do business. And please don't tell Tom Enright, because I'm originally from Wexford. Um, 
But it is, it is these kind of events. It is the business community. It is the local authority. It is the educators. It is all of the stakeholders coming together to make this a better place to live, to work, to do business. And for all of your part in contributing to that, I'd just like to thank you. Thank you. Thanks, well. Okay, um, we're just finished now, so I just want to say a very sincere thank you to Siobhan for her leadership, I suppose, throughout this process. Um, a very big special thank you to my colleague Aoife Sheridan. I think she deserves a fabulous round of applause. <laughs> and, and also to Richard Walsh, I don't know where he's gone, he was here. <laughs> oh, he's, oh, he's in the back, there he is. And to Richard too, as well, for the work. And I suppose, again, it wouldn't happen without the behind the scenes work of Can, uh, Con and Karen, I've amalgamated your names there, uh, from White Light Events. And thank you so much uh, for your really, really professional hard work, as always. I can never, ever uh, doubt the professionalism that you bring to any event and to Empire for hosting us today and to the staff here. And to finally thank you all for participating and attending. I hope you got something from it. As Siobhan says, you know, join the LinkedIn group. Hashtag away on Twitter. Uh, we'll be there. We'll be watching. We'll be picking you up and we'll be inviting you to all of these groups. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.